File 1 of Farthest North, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sharon Riskadal. Farthest North by Friedhoff Nansen, Volume 1, Contents. Chapter 1, Introduction. Chapter 2, Preparations and Equipment. Chapter 3, The Start. Chapter 4, Farewell to Norway. Chapter 5, Voyage through the Kara Sea. Chapter 6, The Winter Night. Chapter 7, The Spring and Summer of 1894. Chapter 8, Second Autumn in the Ice. End of File 1《File Two of Farthest North, Volume One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sharon Riskadal. Farthest North by Friedhoff Nansen, Volume One. Chapter One, Introduction, Part One. Farthest North, being the narrative of the voyage and exploration of the Fram, eighteen ninety-three to ninety-six and the fifteen-month sledge expedition by Dr. Nansen and Lieutenant Johansen, with an appendix by Otto Sverdrup. Chapter 1. Introduction A time will come in later years when the ocean will unloose the bands of things, when the immeasurable earth will lie open, when seafarers will discover new countries, and Thule will no longer be the extreme point among the lands. Seneca Unseen and untrodden under their spotless mantle of ice, the rigid polar region slept the profound sleep of death from the earliest dawn of time. Wrapped in his white shroud, the mighty giant stretched his clammy ice limbs abroad and dreamed his age-long dreams. Ages passed, deep was the silence. Then, in the dawn of history, far away in the south, the awakening spirit of man reared its head on high and gazed over the earth. To the south it encountered warmth, to the north cold, and behind the boundaries of the unknown it placed in imagination the twin kingdoms of consuming heat and of deadly cold. But the limits of the unknown had to recede step by step before the ever-increasing yearning after light and knowledge of the human mind, till they made a stand in the north at the threshold of nature's great ice temple of the polar regions with their endless silence. Up to this point no insuperable obstacles had opposed the progress of the advancing hosts, which confidently proceeded on their way but here the ramparts of ice and the long darkness of winter brought them to bay. Host after host marched on towards the north, only to suffer defeat. Fresh ranks stood ever ready to advance over the bodies of their predecessors. Shrouded in fog lay the mythic land of Nivelheim, where the Rimterser carried on their wild gambols. Why did we continually return to the attack? There in the darkness and cold stood Helheim, where the death goddess held her sway. There lay Nostrand, the shore of corpses. Thither, where no living being could draw breath, thither troop after troop made its way. To what end? Was it to bring home the dead, as did Hermod when he rode after Baldur? No, it was simply to satisfy man's thirst for knowledge. Nowhere, in truth, has knowledge been purchased at greater cost of privation and suffering. But the spirit of mankind will never rest till every spot of these regions has been trodden by the foot of man, till every enigma has been solved. Minute by minute, degree by degree, we have stolen forwards with painful effort. Slowly the day has approached. Even now we are but in its early dawn, Darkness still broods over vast tracts around the pole. Our ancestors, the old Vikings, were the first Arctic voyagers. 
it has been said that their expeditions to the frozen sea were of no moment as they left no enduring marks behind them this however is scarcely correct just as surely as the whalers of our age in their persistent struggles with ice and sea form our outposts of investigation up in the north so were the old northmen with eric the red leif and others at their head the pioneers of the polar expeditions of future generations it should be borne in mind that as they were the first ocean navigators so also they were the first to combat with the ice long before other seafaring nations had ventured to do more than hug the coastlines our ancestors had traversed the open seas in all directions had discovered iceland and greenland and had colonized them at a later period they discovered america and did not shrink from making a straight course over the atlantic ocean from greenland to norway many and many a bout must they have had with the ice along the coasts of greenland in their open barks and many a life must have been lost and that which impelled them to undertake these expeditions was not the mere love of adventure though that is indeed one of the essential traits of our national character it was rather the necessity of discovering new countries for the many restless beings that could find no room in norway furthermore they were stimulated by a real interest for knowledge othar who about eight ninety resided in england at alfred's court set out on an errand of geographical investigation or as he says himself he felt an inspiration and a desire to learn to know and to demonstrate how far the land stretched toward the north and if there were any regions inhabited by man northward beyond the desert waste he lived in the northernmost part of helgeland probably at bjorkoy and sailed around the north cape and eastwards even to the white sea Adam of Bremen relates of Harald Hardrad, the experienced king of the Northmen, that he undertook a voyage out into the sea towards the north, and explored the expanse of the northern ocean with his ships, but darkness spread over the verge where the world falls away, and he put about barely in time to escape being swallowed in the vast abyss. This was Gunungagap the abyss at the world's end how far he went no one knows but at all events he deserves recognition as one of the first of the polar navigators that were animated by pure love of knowledge naturally these northmen were not free from the superstitious ideas about the polar regions prevalent in their times there indeed they placed their Gunungagap, their Nivelheim, Helheim, and later on Trollabotten. But even these mythical and poetical ideas contained so large a kernel of observation that our fathers may be said to have possessed a remarkably clear conception of the true nature of things. How soberly and correctly they observed may best be seen a couple hundred years later in Congaspila the mirror of kings the most scientific treatise of our ancient literature where it is said that as soon as one has traversed the greater part of the wild sea one comes upon such a huge quantity of ice that nowhere in the whole world has the like been known some of the ice is so flat that it looks as if it were frozen on the sea itself it is from eight to ten feet thick and extends so far out into the sea that it would take a journey of four or more days to reach the land over it but this ice lies more to the northeast or north beyond the limits of the land than to the south and southwest or west this ice is of a wonderful nature it lies at times quite still as one would expect with openings or large fjords in it but sometimes its movement is so strong and rapid as to equal that of a ship running before the wind and it drifts against the wind as often as with it this is a conception all the more remarkable 
when viewed in the light of the crude ideas entertained by the rest of the world at that period with regard to foreign climes. The strength of our people now dwindled away, and centuries elapsed before explorers once more sought the northern seas. Then it was other nations, especially the Dutch and the English, that led the van. The sober observations of the old Northmen were forgotten, and in their stead we meet with repeated instances of the attraction of mankind towards the most fantastic ideas, a tendency of thought that found ample scope in the regions of the North. When the cold proved not to be absolutely deadly, theories flew to the opposite extreme, and marvelous were the erroneous ideas that sprang up and have held their own down to the present day. Over and over again it has been the same. The most natural explanation of phenomena is the very one that men have most shunned. And if no middle course was to be found, they have rushed to the wildest hypothesis. It is only thus that the belief in an open polar sea could have arisen and held its ground. Though everywhere ice was met with, people maintained that this open sea must lie behind the ice. Thus the belief in an ice-free northeast and northwest passage to the wealth of Cathay or of India, first propounded toward the close of the fifteenth century, cropped up again and again, only to be again and again refuted. Since the ice barred the southern regions, the way must lie further north, and finally a passage over the pole itself was sought for. Wild as these theories were, they have worked for the benefit of mankind, for by their means our knowledge of the earth has been widely extended. Hence we may see that no work done in the service of investigation is ever lost, not even when carried out under false assumptions. England has to thank these chimeras in no small degree for the fact that she has become the mightiest seafaring nation of the world. By many paths and by many means, mankind has endeavored to penetrate this kingdom of death. At first the attempt was made exclusively by sea. Ships were then ill-adapted to combat the ice, and people were loath to make the venture. The clinker-built pine and fir barks of the old Northmen were no better fitted for the purpose than were the small clumsy carvels of the first English and Dutch Arctic explorers. Little by little they learned to adapt their vessels to the conditions, and with ever-increasing daring they forced them in among the dreaded flows. But the uncivilized polar tribes, both those that inhabit the Siberian tundras and the Eskimo of North America, had discovered, long before polar expeditions had begun, another and a safer means of traversing these regions, to wit the sledge usually drawn by dogs. It was in Siberia that this excellent method of locomotion was first applied to the service of polar exploration. Already in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries, the Russians undertook very extensive sledge journeys and charted the whole of the Siberian coast from the borders of Europe to Bering Strait. And they did not merely travel along the coasts, but crossed the drift ice itself to the new Siberian islands and even north of them. Nowhere, perhaps, have travelers gone through so many sufferings or evinced so much endurance. In America, too, the sledge was employed by Englishmen at an early date for the purpose of exploring the shores of the Arctic seas. Sometimes the toboggan or Indian sledge was used, sometimes that of the Eskimo. It was under the able leadership of McClintock that sledge journeys attained their highest development. While the Russians had generally traveled with a large number of dogs and only a few men, the English employed many more men on their expeditions, and their sledges were entirely, or for the most part, drawn by the explorers themselves. Thus, in the most energetic attempt ever made to reach high latitudes, Albert Markham's memorable march towards the north from the Alert's winter quarters, 
there were thirty-three men who had to draw the sledges, though there were plenty of dogs on board the ship. During his famous expedition in search of Franklin, McClintock used both men and dogs. The American traveler Perry, however, adopted a totally different method of traveling on the inland ice of Greenland, employing as few men and as many dogs as possible. The great importance of dogs for sledge journeys was clear to me before I undertook my Greenland expedition, and the reason I did not use them then was simply that I was unable to procure any serviceable animals. A third method may yet be mentioned, which has been employed in the Arctic regions, namely boats and sledges combined. It is said of the old Northmen in the sagas and in the Congaspiel that for days on end they had to drag their boats over the ice in the Greenland Sea in order to reach land. The first in modern times to make use of this means of traveling was Perry, who in his memorable attempt to reach the Pole in 1827 abandoned his ship and made his way over the drift ice northwards with boats which he dragged on sledges. He succeeded in attaining the highest latitude, 82 degrees, 45 minutes, that had yet been reached. But here the current carried him to the south more rapidly than he could advance against it, and he was obliged to turn back. Of later years this method of traveling has not been much employed in approaching the pole. It may, however, be mentioned that Markham took boats with him also on his sledge expedition. Many expeditions have, through sheer necessity, accomplished long distances over the drift ice in this way, in order to reach home after having abandoned or lost their ship. A special mention may be made of the Austro-Hungarian Tegethoff expedition to Franz Josef Land and the ill-fated American Jeannette expedition. It seems that but few have thought of following the example of the Eskimo, living as they do, and, instead of heavy boats, taking light kayaks drawn by dogs. At all events, no attempts have been made in this direction. The methods of advance have been tested on four main routes, the Smith Sound route, the sea route between Greenland and Spitsbergen, Franz Josef Land route, and the Bering Strait route. In later times, the point from which the pole has been most frequently assailed is Smith Sound, probably because American explorers had somewhat too hastily asserted that they had there described the open polar sea, extending indefinitely towards the north. Every expedition was stopped, however, by immense masses of ice, which came drifting southwards and piled themselves up against the coasts. The most important expedition by this route was the English one conducted by Nares in 1875 to 76, the equipment of which involved a vast expenditure. Markham, the next in command to Nares, reached the highest latitude till then attained, 83 degrees 20 minutes, but at the cost of enormous exertion and loss. And Nares was of the opinion that the impossibility of reaching the pole by this route was fully demonstrated for all future ages. During the stay of the Greeley expedition from 1881 to 1884 in this same region, Lockwood attained a somewhat higher record, that is, 83 degrees 24 minutes, the most northerly point on the globe that human feet had trodden previous to the expedition of which the present work treats. By way of the sea between Greenland and Spitsbergen, several attempts have been made to penetrate the secrets of the domain of ice. In 1607, Henry Hudson endeavored to reach the Pole along the east coast of Greenland, where he was in hopes of finding an open basin and a waterway to the Pacific. His progress was, however, stopped at 73 degrees north latitude at a point of the coast which he named Hold with Hope. The German expedition under Coldway, 1869-70, to 70, which visited the same waters, reached by the aid of sledges as far north as 77 degrees north latitude. 
Owing to the enormous masses of ice which the polar currents sweep southward along this coast, it is certainly one of the most unfavorable routes for a polar expedition. A better route is that by Spitzbergen, which was essayed by Hudson when his progress was blocked off Greenland. Here he reached 80 degrees 23 minutes north latitude. Thanks to the warm current that runs by the west coast of Spitzbergen in a northerly direction, the sea is kept free from ice, and it is without comparison the route by which one can the most safely and easily reach high latitudes in ice-free waters. It was north of Spitzbergen that Edward Perry made his attempt in 1827, above alluded to. Further eastwards, the ice conditions are less favorable, and therefore few polar expeditions have directed their course through these regions. The original object of the Austro-Hungarian expedition under Weiprecht and Payer, 1872-74, was to seek for the northeast passage, but at its first meeting with the ice it was set fast off the north point of Novaya Zimlia, drifted northwards, and discovered Franz Josef Land, whence Payer endeavored to push forwards to the north with sledges, reaching 82 degrees five minutes north latitude on an island which he named crown prince rudolph's land to the north of this he thought he could see an extensive tract of land lying in about eighty three degrees north latitude which he called petterman's land franz joseph land was afterwards twice visited by the english traveller lee smith in eighteen eighty and eighteen eighty one to eighty two and it is here that the English Jackson Harmsworth expedition is at present established. The plan of the Danish expedition under Hovgard was to push forward to the North Pole from Cape Chelyuskin along the east coast of an extensive tract of land which Hovgard thought must lie to the east of Franz Josef Land. He got set fast in the ice, however, in the Kara Sea, and remained the winter there, returning home the following year. Only a few attempts have been made through Bering Strait. The first was Cook's in 1776. The last, the Jeannette Expedition, 1879-81, to under De Long, a lieutenant in the American Navy. Scarcely anywhere have polar travelers been so hopelessly blocked by ice in comparatively low latitudes. The last-named expedition, however, had a most important bearing upon my own. As DeLong himself says in a letter to Gordon Bennett, who supplied the funds for the expedition, he was of opinion that there were three routes to choose from, Smith Sound, the east coast of Greenland, or Bering Strait. But he put most faith in the last, and this was ultimately selected. His main reason for this choice was his belief in a Japanese current running north through Bering Strait, and onwards along the east coast of Wrangell Land, which was believed to extend far to the north. It was urged that the warm water of this current would open a way along that coast, possibly up to the Pole. The experience of whalers showed that whenever their vessels were set fast in the ice here, they drifted northwards. Hence it was concluded that the current generally set in that direction. This will help explorers, says DeLong, to reach high latitudes, but at the same time will make it more difficult for them to come back. The truth of these words he himself was to learn by bitter experience. The Jeannette stuck fast in the ice on September 6, 1879, in 71 degrees 35 minutes north latitude, and 175 degrees 6 minutes east longitudes southeast of Wrangell's land, which, however, proved to be a small island, and drifted with the ice in a west-northwesterly direction for two years, when it foundered, June 12, 1881, north of the New Siberian Islands, in 77 degrees 15 minutes north latitude, and 154 degrees 59 minutes east longitude. Everywhere, then, has the ice stopped the progress of mankind towards the north. In two cases only have ice-bound vessels drifted in a northerly direction, in the case of the Tegethoff and the Jeannette, 
while most of the others have been carried away from their goal by masses of ice drifting southwards. On reading the history of Arctic explorations, it early occurred to me that it would be very difficult to wrest the secrets from these unknown regions of ice by adopting the routes and the methods hitherto employed. But where did the proper route lie? It was in the autumn of 1884 that I happened to see an article by Professor Mohn in the Norwegian Morgenblad, in which it was stated that sundry articles which must have come from the Jeannette had been found on the southwest coast of Greenland. He conjectured that they must have drifted on a flow right across the polar sea. It immediately occurred to me that here lay the route ready to hand. If a flow could drift right across the unknown region, that drift might be enlisted in the service of exploration, and my plan was laid. Some years, however, elapsed before, in February 1890, after my return from my Greenland expedition, I at last propounded the idea in an address before the Christiania Geographical Society. As this address plays an important part in the history of the expedition, I shall reproduce its principal features as printed in the March number of Naturan, 1891. After giving a brief sketch of the different polar expeditions of former years, I go on to say, The results of these numerous attempts, as I have pointed out, seem somewhat discouraging. They appear to show plainly enough that it is impossible to sail to the pole by any route whatever for everywhere the ice has proved an impenetrable barrier and has stayed the progress of invaders on the threshold of the unknown regions to drag boats over the uneven drift ice which moreover is constantly moving under the influence of the current and the wind is an equally great difficulty the ice lays such obstacles in the way that any one who has ever attempted to traverse it will not hesitate to declare it well nigh impossible to advance in this manner, with the equipment and provisions requisite for such an undertaking. Had we been able to advance overland, I said, that would have been the most certain route. In that case, the pole could have been reached in one summer by Norwegian snowshoe runners. But there is every reason to doubt the existence of any such land. Greenland, I considered, did not extend further than the most northerly known point of its west coast. It is not probable that Franz Joseph Land reaches to the Pole. From all we can learn, it forms a group of islands separated from each other by deep sounds, and it appears improbable that any large continuous tract of land is to be found there. Some people are perhaps of opinion that one ought to defer the examination of regions like those around the Pole, beset as they are with so many difficulties, till new means of transport have been discovered. I have heard it intimated that one fine day we shall be able to reach the Pole by a balloon, and that it is only waste of time to seek to get there before that day comes. It need scarcely be shown that this line of reasoning is untenable. Even if one could really suppose that in the near or distant future, this frequently mooted idea of traveling to the Pole in an airship would be realized, such an expedition, however interesting it might be in certain respects, would be far from yielding the scientific results of expeditions carried out in the manner here indicated. Scientific results of importance in all branches of research can be attained only by persistent observations during a lengthened sojourn in these regions, while those of a balloon expedition cannot but be of a transitory nature. We must then endeavor to ascertain if there are not other routes, and I believe there are. I believe that if we pay attention to the actually existent forces of nature and seek to work with and not against them, we shall thus find the safest and easiest method of reaching the pole. It is useless, as previous expeditions have done, to work against the current. We should see if there is not a current we can work with. The Jeannette expedition is the only one, in my opinion, that started on the right track, though it may have been unwittingly and unwillingly. 
The Jeanette drifted for two years in the ice, from Wrangel Land to the New Siberian Islands. Three years after she foundered to the north of these islands, there was found frozen into the drift ice in the neighborhood of Julianhab on the southwest coast of Greenland a number of articles which appeared from sundry indubitable marks to proceed from the sunken vessel. These articles were first discovered by the Eskimo and were afterwards collected by Mr. Lightson, colonial manager at Julianhab, who has given a list of them in the Danish Geographical Journal for 1885. Among them, the following may especially be mentioned. 1. A list of provisions signed by De Long, the commander of the Jeannette. 2. An MS list of the Jeannette's boats. 3. A pair of oilskin breeches marked Louis Noros, the name of one of the Jeannette's crew, who was saved. 4. The peak of a cap on which, according to Lightson's statement, was written F. C. Lindemann. The name of one of the crew of the Jeannette, who was also saved, was F. C. Nindemann. This may either have been a clerical error on Lutzen's part, or a misprint in the Danish journal. In America, when it was reported that these articles had been found, people were very skeptical and doubts of their genuineness were expressed in the American newspapers. The facts, however, can scarcely be sheer inventions, and it may therefore be safely assumed that an ice floe bearing these articles from the Jeannette had drifted from the place where it sank to Julianhab. By what route did this ice floe reach the west coast of Greenland? Professor Mohn, in a lecture before the Scientific Society of Christiania, in November 1894, showed that it could have come by no other way then across the pole. It cannot possibly have come through Smith Sound, as the current there passes along the western side of Baffin's Bay, and it would thus have been conveyed to Baffin's Land or Labrador, and not to the west coast of Greenland. The current flows along this coast in a northerly direction, and is a continuation of the Greenland polar current, which comes along the east coast of Greenland, takes a bend around Cape Farewell, and passes upwards along the west coast. It is by this current only that the flow could have come. But now the question arises, what route did it take from the New Siberian Islands in order to reach the east coast of Greenland? It is conceivable that it might have drifted along the north coast of Siberia, south of Franz Josef Land, up through the sound between Franz Josef Land and Spitsbergen, or even to the south of Spitsbergen, and might after that have got into the polar current which flows along Greenland. If, however, we study the directions of the currents in these regions, so far as they are at present ascertained, it will be found that this is extremely improbable, not to say impossible. Having shown that this is evident from the Tegethoff drift, and from many other circumstances, I proceeded. The distance from the New Siberian Islands to the 80th degree of latitude on the east coast of Greenland is 1,360 miles, and the distance from the last named place to Julianhab, 1,540 miles, making together a distance of 2,900 miles. This distance was traversed by the flow in 1,100 days, which gives a speed of 2.6 miles per day of 24 hours. The time during which the relics drifted after having reached the 80th degree of latitude till they arrived at Julianhab can be calculated with tolerable precision, as the speed of the above-named current along the east coast of Greenland is well known. It may be assumed that it took at least 400 days to accomplish this distance. There remained then about 700 days, as the longest time the drifting articles can have taken from the New Siberian Islands to the 80th degree of latitude. Supposing that they took the shortest route, i.e. across the pole, this computation gives a speed of about two miles in 24 hours. On the other hand, supposing they went by the route south of Franz Josef Land and south of Spitsbergen, 
they must have drifted at a much higher speed two miles in the twenty-four hours however coincides most remarkably with the rate at which the jeannette drifted during the last months of her voyage from january first to june twelfth eighteen eighty one in this time she drifted at an average rate of a little over two miles in the twenty-four hours if however the average speed of the whole of the jeannette's drifting be taken it will be found to be only one mile in the twenty-four hours but are there no other evidences of current flowing across the north pole from bering sea on the one side to the atlantic ocean on the other yes there are dr rink received from a greenlander at gothaab a remarkable piece of wood which had been found among the drift timber on the coast it is one of the throwing sticks which the eskimo use in hurling their bird darts but altogether unlike those used by the eskimo on the west coast of greenland dr rink conjectured that it possibly proceeded from the eskimo on the east coast of greenland from later inquiries however it appeared that it must have come from the coast of alaska on the neighborhood of bering strait as that is the only place where throwing sticks of a similar form are used it was even ornamented with chinese glass beads exactly similar to those which the alaskan eskimo obtained by barter from asiatic tribes and used for the decoration of their throwing sticks we may therefore with confidence assert that this piece of wood was carried from the west coast of alaska over to greenland by a current the whole course of which we do not know but which may be assumed to flow very near the north pole or at some place between it and franz joseph land there are moreover still further proofs that such a current exists as is well known no trees grow in greenland that can be used for making boats sledges or other appliances the driftwood that is carried down by the polar current along the east coast of greenland and up the west coast is therefore essential to the existence of the greenland eskimo but whence does this timber come here our inquiries again carry us to lands on the other side of the pole I have myself had an opportunity of examining large quantities of driftwood, both on the west coast and on the east coast of Greenland. I have, moreover, found pieces drifting in the sea off the east coast, and, like earlier travelers, have arrived at the conclusion that much the greater part of it can only have come from Siberia, while a smaller portion may possibly have come from America. For amongst it are to be found fir, Siberian larch, and other kinds of wood peculiar to the north which could scarcely have come from any other quarter interesting in this respect are the discoveries that have been made on the east coast of greenland by the second german polar expedition out of twenty-five pieces of driftwood seventeen were siberian larch five norwegian fir probably pica obovata two a kind of alder alnus incana and one a poplar populus tremula the common aspen all of which are trees found in siberia by way of supplement to these observations on the greenland side it may be mentioned that the jeannette expedition frequently found siberian driftwood fir and birch between the flows in a strong northerly current to the northward of the new siberian islands fortunately for the eskimo such large quantities of this driftwood come every year to the coasts of greenland that in my opinion one cannot but assume that they are conveyed thither by a constantly flowing current especially as the wood never appears to have been very long in the sea at all events not without having been frozen into the ice that this driftwood passes south of franz josef land and spitzbergen is quite as unreasonable a theory as that the ice flow with the relics from the jeannette drifted by this route in further disproof of this assumption it may be stated that siberian driftwood is found north of spitzbergen in the strong southerly current against which perry fought in vain it appears therefore that on these grounds also we cannot but admit the existence of a current flowing across or in close proximity to the pole 
as an interesting fact in this connection it may also be mentioned that the german botanist griesbach has shown that the greenland flora includes a series of siberian vegetable forms that could scarcely have reached greenland in any other way than by the help of such a current conveying the seeds on the drift ice in denmark strait between iceland and greenland i have made observations which tend to the conclusion that this ice too was of siberian origin for instance i found quantities of mud on it which seemed to be of siberian origin or might possibly have come from north american rivers it is possible however to maintain that this mud originates in the glacier rivers that flow from under the ice in the north of greenland or in other unknown polar lands so that this piece of evidence is of less importance than those already named putting all this together we seem driven to the conclusion that a current flows at some point between the pole and franz joseph land from the siberian arctic sea to the east coast of greenland that such must be the case we may also infer in another way if we regard for instance the polar current that broad current which flows down from the unknown polar regions between spitzbergen and greenland and consider what an enormous mass of water it carries along it must seem self-evident that this cannot come from a circumscribed and small basin but must needs be gathered from distant sources the more so as the polar sea so far as we know it is remarkably shallow everywhere to the north of the european asiatic and american coasts the polar current is no doubt fed by that branch of the gulf stream which makes its way up the west side of spitzbergen but this small stream is far from being sufficient and the main body of its water must be derived from further northwards it is probable that the polar current stretches its suckers as it were to the coast of siberia and bering strait and draws its supplies from these distant regions the water it carries off is replaced partly through the warm current before mentioned which makes its way through the bering strait and partly by that branch of the gulf stream which passing by the north of norway bends eastwards towards novaya zemlya and of which a great portion unquestionably continues its course along the north coast of this island into the siberian arctic sea that a current coming from the south takes this direction at all events in some measure appears probable from the well-known fact that in the northern hemisphere the rotation of the earth tends to compel a northward flowing current whether of water or of air to assume an easterly course the earth's rotation may also cause a southward flowing stream like the polar current to direct its course westward to the east coast of greenland but even if these currents flowing in the polar basin did not exist i am still of opinion that in some other way a body of water must collect in it sufficient to form a polar current in the first place there are the north european the siberian and north american rivers debouching into the arctic sea to supply this water the fluvial basin of these rivers is very considerable comprising a large portion of northern europe almost the whole of northern asia or siberia down to the altai mountains and lake baikal together with the principal part of alaska and british north america all these added together form no unimportant portion of the earth and the rainfall of these countries is enormous it is not conceivable that the arctic sea of itself could contribute anything of importance to this rainfall for in the first place it is for the most part covered with drift ice from which the evaporation is but trifling and in the next place the comparatively low temperature in these regions prevents any considerable evaporation taking place even from open surfaces of water the moisture that produces this rainfall must consequently in a great measure come from elsewhere principally from the atlantic and pacific oceans and the amount of water which thereby feeds the arctic sea must be very considerable if we possess sufficient knowledge of the rainfall in the different localities it might be exactly calculated 
the importance of this augmentation appears even greater when we consider that the polar basin is comparatively small and as has been already remarked very shallow its greatest known depth being from sixty to eighty fathoms but there is still another factor that must help to increase the quantity of water in the polar basin and that is its own rainfall Weiprecht has already pointed out the probability that the large influx of warm moist atmosphere from the south attracted by the constant low atmospheric pressure in the polar regions must engender so large a rainfall as to augment considerably the amount of water in the polar sea moreover the fact that the polar basin receives large supplies of fresh water is proved by the small amount of salt in the water of the polar current from all these considerations it appears unquestionable that the sea around the pole is fed with considerable quantities of water partly fresh as we have just seen partly salt as we indicated further back proceeding from the different ocean currents it thus becomes inevitable according to the law of equilibrium that these masses of water should seek such an outlet as we find in the greenland polar current End of file two. File three of Farthest North, Volume One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sharon Riskadal. Farthest North by Fritjof Nansen, Volume One. Chapter One Introduction. Part two. Let us now inquire whether further reasons can be found to show why this current flows exactly in the given direction. If we examine the ocean soundings, we at once find a conclusive reason why the main outlet must lie between Spitzbergen and Greenland. The sea here, so far as we know it, is at all points very deep. There is indeed a channel of as much as 2,500 fathoms depth while south of Spitzbergen and Franz Josef Land it is remarkably shallow, not more than 160 fathoms. As has been stated, a current passes northwards through Bering Strait, and Smith Sound and the sounds between the islands north of America, though here indeed there is a southward current, are far too small and narrow to form adequate outlets for the mass of water of which we are speaking. There is therefore no other assumption left, than that this mass of water must find its outlet by the route actually followed by the polar current. The channel discovered by the Jeannette expedition between Wrangel Land and the New Siberian Islands may here be mentioned as a notable fact. It extended in a northerly direction, and was at some points more than eighty fathoms deep, while at the sides the soundings ran only to forty or fifty fathoms. It is by no means impossible that this channel may be a continuation of the channel between Spitzbergen and Greenland, in which case it would certainly influence, if not actually determine, the direction of the main current. If we examine the conditions of wind and atmospheric pressure over the polar sea, as far as they are known, it would appear that they must tend to produce a current across the pole in the direction indicated. From the Atlantic to the south of Spitzbergen and Franz Josef Land, a belt of low atmospheric pressure, minimum belt, extends into the Siberian Arctic Sea. In accordance with well-known laws, the wind must have a preponderating direction from west to east on the south side of this belt, and this would promote an eastward-flowing current along the north coast of Siberia such as has been found to exist there. The winds on the north side of the minimum belt must, however, blow mainly in a direction from east to west, and will consequently produce a westerly current, passing across the pole towards the Greenland Sea, exactly as we have seen to be the case. It thus appears that, from whatever side we consider this question, even apart from the specially cogent evidences above cited, we cannot escape the conclusion that a current passes across or very near to the pole into the sea between Greenland and Spitzbergen. 
this being so it seems to me that the plain thing for us to do is to make our way into the current on that side of the pole where it flows northward and by its help to penetrate into those regions which all who have hitherto worked against it have sought in vain to reach my plan is briefly as follows i propose to have a ship built as small and as strong as possible just big enough to contain supplies of coals and provisions for twelve men for five years a ship of about one hundred seventy tons gross will probably suffice its engine should be powerful enough to give a speed of six knots but in addition it must also be fully rigged for sailing the main point in this vessel is that it be built on such principles as to enable it to withstand the pressure of the ice the sides must slope sufficiently to prevent the ice when it presses together from getting firm hold of the hull as was the case with the jeannette and other vessels instead of nipping the ship the ice must raise it up out of the water no very new departure in construction is likely to be needed for the jeannette notwithstanding her preposterous build was able to hold out against the ice pressure for about two years that a vessel can easily be built on such lines as to fulfill these requirements no one will question who has seen a ship nipped by the ice for the same reason too the ship ought to be a small one for besides being thus easier to maneuver in the ice it will be more readily lifted by the pressure of the ice not to mention that it will be easier to give it the requisite strength it must of course be built of picked materials a ship of the form and size here indicated will not be a good or comfortable sea boat but that is of minor importance in waters filled with ice such as we are here speaking of it is true that it would have to travel a long distance over the open sea before it would get so far but it would not be so bad a sea boat as to be unable to get along even though seasick passengers might have to offer sacrifices to the gods of the sea with such a ship and a crew of ten or at the most twelve able-bodied and carefully picked men with a full equipment for five years in every respect as good as modern appliances permit of i am of opinion that the undertaking would be well secured against risk with this ship we should sail up through bering strait and westward along the north coast of siberia towards the new siberian islands as early in the summer as the ice would permit arrived at the new siberian islands it will be advisable to employ the time to the best advantage in examining the conditions of currents and ice and to wait for the most opportune moment to advance as far as possible in ice-free water which judging by the accounts of the ice conditions north of bering strait given by american whalers will probably be in august or the beginning of september when the right time has arrived then we shall plough our way in amongst the ice as far as we can we may venture to conclude from the experience of the jeannette expedition that we should thus be able to reach a point north of the most northerly of the new siberian islands de long notes in his journey that while the expedition was drifting in the ice north of bennett island they saw all around them a dark water sky that is to say a sky which gives a dark reflection of open water indicating such a sea as would be at all events to some extent navigable by a strong ice ship next it must be borne in mind that the whole jeannette expedition travelled in boats partly in open water from bennett island to the siberian coast where as we know the majority of them met with a lamentable end nordenskjold advanced no farther northwards than to the southernmost of the islands mentioned at the end of august but here he found the water everywhere open it is therefore probable that we may be able to push our way up past the new siberian islands and that accomplished we shall be right in the current which carried the jeannette the thing will then be simply to force our way northwards till we are set fast 
Next we must choose a fitting place and moor the ship firmly between suitable ice floes, and then let the ice screw itself together as much as it likes, the more the better. The ship will simply be hoisted up and will ride safely and firmly. It is possible it may heel over to a certain extent under this pressure, but that will scarcely be of much importance. Henceforth the current will be our motive power, while our ship, no longer a means of transport, will become a barrack, and we shall have ample time for scientific observations. In this manner the expedition will, as above indicated, probably drift across the pole and onwards to the sea between Greenland and Spitsbergen. And when we get down to the eightieth degree of latitude, or even sooner if it is summer, there is every likelihood of our getting the ship free and being able to sail home. Should she, however, be lost before this, which is certainly possible, though as I think very unlikely if she is constructed in the way above described, the expedition will not therefore be a failure, for our homeward course must in any case follow the polar current on to the North Atlantic Basin. There is plenty of ice to drift on, and of this means of locomotion we have already had experience. If the Jeannette expedition had had sufficient provisions, and had remained on the ice floe on which the relics were ultimately found, the result would doubtless have been very different from what it was. Our ship cannot possibly founder under the ice pressure so quickly, but that there would be time enough to remove, with all our equipment and provisions, to a substantial ice floe, which we should have selected beforehand in view of such a contingency. Here the tents which we should take with us to meet this contingency would be pitched. In order to preserve our provisions and other equipments, we should not place them all together on one spot, but should distribute them over the ice, laying them on rafts of planks and beams, which we should have built on it. This will obviate the possibility of any of our equipment sinking, even should the floe on which they are break up. The crew of the Hansa, who drifted for more than half a year along the east coast of Greenland, in this way lost a great quantity of their supplies. For the success of such an expedition, two things only are required, that is, good clothing and plenty of food, and these we can take care to have with us. We should thus be able to remain as safely on our ice floe as in our ship, and should advance just as well towards the Greenland Sea. The only difference would be that on our arrival there, instead of proceeding by ship, we must take to our boats, which would convey us just as safely to the nearest harbor. Thus, it seems to me, there is an overwhelming probability that such an expedition would be successful. Many people, however, will certainly urge, in all currents there are eddies and backwaters. Suppose, then, you get into one of these, or perhaps stumble on an unknown land up by the pole and remain lying fast there, how will you extricate yourselves? To this I would merely reply, as concerns the backwater, that we must get out of it just as surely as we got into it, and that we shall have provisions for five years. And as regards the other possibility, we should hail such an occurrence with delight, for no spot on earth could well be found of greater scientific interest. On this newly discovered land, we should make as many observations as possible. Should time wear on and find us still unable to get our ship into the set of the current again, there would be nothing for it but to abandon her and with our boats and necessary stores to search for the nearest current in order to drift in the manner before mentioned. How long may we suppose such a voyage to occupy? As we have already seen, the relics of the Jeannette expedition at most took two years to drift along the same course down to the eightieth degree of latitude, where we may with tolerable certainty count upon getting loose. This would correspond to a rate of about two miles per day of twenty-four hours. We may therefore not unreasonably calculate on reaching this point in the course of two years, 
and it is also possible that the ship might be set free in a higher latitude than is here contemplated five years provisions must therefore be regarded as ample but is not the cold in winter in these regions so severe that life will be impossible there is no probability of this we can even say with tolerable certainty that the pole itself is not so cold in winter as it is for example in the north of siberia an inhabited region or on the northern part of the west coast of greenland which is also inhabited meteorologists have calculated that the mean temperature at the pole in january is about minus thirty three degrees fahrenheit minus thirty six degrees celsius while for example in yakutsk it is minus forty three degrees fahrenheit minus forty two degrees celsius and in verkayansk minus fifty four degrees fahrenheit minus forty eight degrees celsius we should remember that the pole is probably covered with sea radiation from which is considerably less than from large land surfaces such as the plains of north asia the polar region has therefore in all probability a marine climate with comparatively mild winters but by way of a set-off with cold summers the cold in these regions cannot then be any direct obstacle one difficulty however which many former expeditions have had to contend against and which must not be overlooked here is scurvy during a sojourn of any long duration in so cold a climate this malady will unquestionably show itself unless one is able to obtain fresh provisions i think however it may be safely assumed that the very various and nutritious foods now available in the form of hermetically closed preparations of different kinds together with the scientific knowledge we now possess of the foodstuffs necessary for bodily health will enable us to hold this danger at a distance nor do i think that there will be an entire absence of fresh provisions in the water we shall travel through polar bears and seals we may safely calculate on finding far to the north if not up to the very pole it may be mentioned also that the sea must certainly contain quantities of small animals that might serve as food in case of necessity it will be seen that whatever difficulties may be suggested as possible they are not so great but they can be surmounted by means of a careful equipment a fortunate selection of the members of the expedition and judicious leadership so that good results may be hoped for we may reckon on getting out into the sea between greenland and spitzbergen as surely as we can reckon on getting into the jeannette current off the new siberian islands but if this jeannette current does not pass right across the pole if for instance it passes between the pole and franz josef land as above intimated what will the expedition do in that case to reach the earth's axis yes this may seem to be the achilles heel of the undertaking for should the ship be carried past the pole at more than one degree's distance it may then appear extremely imprudent and unsafe to abandon it in mid-current and face such a long sledge journey over uneven sea ice which itself is drifting even if one reached the pole it would be very uncertain whether one could find the ship again on returning i am however of opinion that this is of small import it is not to seek for the exact mathematical point that forms the northern extremity of the earth's axis that we set out for to reach this point is intrinsically of small moment our object is to investigate the great unknown region that surrounds the pole and these investigations will be equally important from a scientific point of view whether the expedition passes over the polar point itself or at some distance from it in this lecture i had submitted the most important data on which my plan was founded but in the following years i continued to study the conditions of the northern waters and received ever fresh proofs that my surmise of a drift right across the polar sea was correct in a lecture delivered before the geographical society in christiania on september twenty eighth eighteen ninety two i alluded to some of these enquiries 
I laid stress on the fact that on considering the thickness and extent of the drift ice in the seas on both sides of the pole, one cannot but be struck by the fact that while the ice on the Asiatic side north of the Siberian coast is comparatively thin, the ice in which the Jeanette drifted was as a rule not more than from seven to ten feet thick, that on the other side, which comes drifting from the north in the sea between Greenland and Spitsbergen, is remarkably massive, and this notwithstanding, that the sea north of Siberia is one of the coldest tracts on the earth. This, I suggested, could be explained only on the assumption that the ice is constantly drifting from the Siberian coast, and that while passing through the unknown and cold sea, there is time for it to attain its enormous thickness, partly by freezing, partly by the constant packing that takes place as the flows screw themselves together. I further mentioned in the same lecture that the mud found on this drift ice seemed to point to a Siberian origin. I did not at the time attach great importance to this fact, but on a further examination of the deposits I had collected during my Greenland expedition, it appeared that it could scarcely come from anywhere else but Siberia. On investigating its mineralogical composition, Dr. Tornabaum of Stockholm came to the conclusion that the greater part of it must be Siberian river mud. He found about twenty different minerals in it. This quantity of dissimilar constituent mineral parts appears to me, he says, to point to the fact that they take their origin from a very extensive tract of land, and one sots naturally turn to Siberia. Moreover, more than half of this mud deposit consisted of humus or boggy soil. More interesting, however, than the actual mud deposit were the diatoms found in it, which were examined by Professor Cleve of Uppsala, who says, These diatoms are decidedly marine, i.e. take their origin from salt water, with some few freshwater forms which the wind has carried from land. The diatomous flora in this dust is quite peculiar and unlike what I have found in many thousands of other specimens, with one exception, with which it shows the most complete conformity, namely a specimen which was collected by Kelman during the Vega expedition on an ice floe off Cape Van Karum near Bering Strait. Species and varieties were perfectly identical in both specimens. Cleve was able to distinguish sixteen species of diatoms. All these appear also in the dust from Cape von Karum, and twelve of them have been found at that place alone, and nowhere else in all the world. This was a notable coincidence between two such remote points, and Cleve is certainly right in saying, It is indeed quite remarkable that the diatomous flora on the ice floes off Bering Strait and on the east coast of Greenland should so completely resemble each other, and should be so utterly unlike all others. It points to an open connection between the seas east of Greenland and north of Asia. Through this open connection, I continued in my address, Drift ice is, therefore, yearly transported across the unknown polar sea. On this same drift ice, and by the same route, it must be no less possible to transport an expedition. When this plan was propounded, it certainly met with approval in various quarters, especially here at home. Thus it was vigorously supported by Professor Mohn, who indeed, by his explanation of the drift of the Jeanette relics, had given the original impulse to it. But, as might be expected, it met with opposition in the main, especially from abroad, while most of the polar travelers and Arctic authorities declared, more or less openly, that it was sheer madness. The year before we set out, in November 1892, I laid it before the Geographical Society in London in a lecture at which the principal Arctic travelers of England were present. After the lecture a discussion took place which plainly showed how greatly I was at variance with the generally accepted opinions as to the conditions in the interior of the Polar Sea, the principles of ice navigation, and the methods that a polar expedition ought to pursue. The eminent Arctic traveler, Admiral Sir Leopold McClintock, 
opened the discussion with the remark i think i may say this is the most adventurous program ever brought under the notice of the royal geographical society he allowed that the facts spoke in favor of the correctness of my theories but was in a high degree doubtful whether my plan could be realized he was especially of opinion that the danger of being crushed in the ice was too great a ship could no doubt be built that would be strong enough to resist the ice pressure in summer but should it be exposed to this pressure in the winter months when the ice resembled a mountain frozen fast to the ship's side he thought that the possibility of being forced up on the surface of the ice was very remote he firmly believed as did the majority of the others that there was no probability of ever seeing the fram again when once she had given herself over to the pitiless polar ice and concluded by saying i wish the doctor full and speedy success but it will be a great relief to his many friends in england when he returns and more particularly to those who have had experience of the dangers at all times inseparable from ice navigation even in regions not quite so far north admiral sir george Norris said the adopted arctic axioms for successfully navigating an icy region are that it is absolutely necessary to keep close to a coastline and that the farther we advance from civilization the more desirable it is to ensure a reasonably safe line of retreat totally disregarding these the ruling principle of the voyage is that the vessel on which if the voyage is in any way successful the sole future hope of the party will depend is to be pushed deliberately into the pack ice thus her commander in lieu of retaining any power over her future movements will be forced to submit to be drifted helplessly about in agreement with the natural movements of the ice in which he is imprisoned supposing the sea currents are as stated the time calculated as necessary to drift with the pack across the polar ice is several years during which time unless new lands are met with the ice near the vessel will certainly never be quiet and the ship herself never free from the danger of being crushed by ice presses to guard against this the vessel is said to be unusually strong and of a special form to enable her to rise when the ice presses against her sides this idea is no novelty whatever but when once frozen into the polar pack the form of the vessel goes for nothing she is hermetically sealed too and forms a part of the ice block surrounding her the form of the ship is for all practical purposes the form of the block of ice in which she is frozen this is a matter of the first importance for there is no record of a vessel frozen into the polar pack having been disconnected from the ice and so rendered capable of rising under pressure as a separate body detached from the ice block even in the height of summer in the event of the destruction of the vessel the boats necessarily fully stored not only for the retreat but for continuing the voyage are to be available this is well in theory but extremely difficult to arrange for in practice preparation to abandon the vessel is the one thing that gives us the most anxiety to place boats etc on the ice pack ready for use involves the danger of being separated from them by a movement of the ice or of losing them altogether should a sudden opening occur if we merely have everything handy for heaving over the side the emergency may be so sudden that we have not time to save anything as regards the assumed drift of the polar ice naras expressed himself on the whole at variance with me he insisted that the drift was essentially determined by the prevailing winds as to the probable direction of the drift the fram starting from near the mouth of the lena river may expect to meet the main pack not farther north than about latitude seventy six degrees thirty minutes i doubt her getting farther north before she is beset but taking an extreme case and giving her sixty miles more she will then only be in the same latitude as cape chelyuskin 
seven hundred thirty miles from the pole and about six hundred miles from my supposed limit of the effective homeward carrying ocean current after a close study of all the information we possess i think the wind will be more likely to drift her towards the west than towards the east with an ice encumbered sea north of her and more open water or newly made ice to the southward the chances are small for a northerly drift at all events at first and afterwards i know of no natural forces that will carry the vessel in any reasonable time much farther from the siberian coast than the Jeannette was carried and during the whole of this time unless protected by newly discovered lands she will be to all intents and purposes immovably sealed up in the pack and exposed to its well-known dangers there is no doubt that there is an ocean connection across the area proposed to be explored in one point however naras was able to declare himself in agreement with me it was the idea that the principal aim of all such voyages is to explore the unknown polar regions not to reach exactly that mathematical point in which the axis of our globe has its northern termination sir alan young says among other things dr nonson assumes the blank space around the axis of the earth to be a pool of water or ice i think the great danger to contend with will be the land in nearly every direction near the pole most previous navigators seem to have continued seeing land again and again further and further north these chinette relics may have drifted through narrow channels and thus finally arrived at their destination and i think it would be an extremely dangerous thing for a ship to drift through them where she might impinge upon the land and be kept for years with regard to the ship's form sir alan young says i do not think the form of the ship is any great point for when a ship is fairly nipped the question is if there is any swell or movement of the ice to lift the ship if there is no swell the ice must go through her whatever material she is made of one or two authorities however expressed themselves in favor of my plan one was the arctic traveller sir e inglefield another captain now admiral horton director of the hydrographic department of england in a letter to the geographical society admiral sir george h richard says on the occasion of my address i regret to have to speak discouragingly of this project but i think that any one who can speak with authority ought to speak plainly where so much may be at stake with regard to the currents he says i believe there is a constant outflow i prefer this word to current from the north in consequence of the displacement of the water from the region of the pole by the ice cap which covers it intensified in its density by the enormous weight of snow accumulated on its surface this outflow takes place on all sides he thinks from the polar basin but should be most pronounced in the tract between the western ends of the perry islands and spitzbergen and with this outflow all previous expeditions have had to contend he does not appear to make any exception as to the tegethoff or jeannette and can find no reason for believing that a current sets north over the pole from the new siberian islands which dr nonson hopes for and believes in it is my opinion that when really within what may be called the inner circle say about seventy eight degrees of latitude there is little current of any kind that would influence a ship in the close ice that must be expected it is when we get outside this circle round the corners as it were into the straight wide channels where the ice is loose that we are really affected by its influence and here the ice gets naturally thinner and more decayed in autumn and less dangerous to a ship within the inner circle probably not much of the ice escapes it becomes older and heavier every year and in all probability completely blocks the navigation of ships entirely this is the kind of ice which was brought to nara's winter quarters at the head of smith sound in about eighty two degrees thirty minutes north 
and this is the ice which markham struggled against in his sledge journey and against which no human power could prevail he attached no real importance to the jeannette relics if found in greenland they may well have drifted down on a flow from the neighborhood of smith sound from some of the american expeditions which went to greeley's rescue it may also well be that some of de long's printed or written documents in regard to his equipment may have been taken out by these expeditions and the same may apply to the other articles he does not however expressly say whether there was any indication of such having been the case in a similar letter to the geographical society the renowned botanist sir joseph hooker says dr nonsen's project is a wide departure from any hitherto put in practice for the purpose of polar discovery and it demands the closest scrutiny both on this account and because it is one involving the greatest peril from my experience of three seasons in the antarctic regions i do not think that a ship of whatever build could long resist destruction if committed to the movements of the pack in the polar regions one built as strongly as the fram would no doubt resist great pressures in the open pack but not any pressure or repeated pressures and still less the thrust of the pack if driven with or by it against land the lines of the fram might be of service so long as she was on an even keel or in ice of no great height above the water line but amongst floes and bergs or when thrown on her beam ends they would avail her nothing if the fram were to drift towards the greenland coast or the american polar islands he is of opinion that supposing a landing could be effected there would be no probability at all of salvation assuming that a landing could be effected it must be on an inhospitable and probably ice-bound coast or on the mountainous ice of a paleocrystic sea with a certainly enfeebled and probably reduced ship's company there could in such a case be no prospect of reaching succor putting aside the possibility of scurvy against which there is no certain prophylactic have the depressing influence on the minds of the crew resulting from long confinement in very close quarters during the many months of darkness extreme cold inaction ennui constant peril and the haunting uncertainty as to the future been sufficiently taken into account perfunctory duties and occupations do not avert the effects of these conditions they hardly mitigate them and have been known to aggravate them i do not consider the attainment of dr nonsen's object by the means at his disposal to be impossible but i do consider that the success of such an enterprise would not justify the exposure of valuable lives for its attainment in america general greeley the leader of the ill-fated expedition generally known by his name eighteen eighty one to eighty four wrote an article in the forum august eighteen ninety one in which he says among other things it strikes me as almost incredible that the plan here advanced by dr nonsen should receive encouragement or support it seems to me to be based on fallacious ideas as to physical conditions within the polar regions and to foreshadow if attempted barren results apart from the suffering and death among its members Dr. Nonsen, so far as I know, has had no Arctic service. His crossing of Greenland, however difficult, is no more polar work than the scaling of Mount St. Elias. It is doubtful if any hydrographer would treat seriously his theory of polar currents, or if any Arctic traveler would endorse the whole scheme. There are perhaps a dozen men whose Arctic service has been such that the positive support of this plan by even a respectable minority would entitle it to consideration and confidence. These men are Admiral McClintock, Richards, Collinson and Nares, and Captain Markham of the Royal Navy, Sir Alan Young, and Lee Smith of England, Coldaway of Germany, Pyre of Austria, Norgenschold of Sweden and Melville in our own country. I have no hesitation in asserting that no two of these believe in the possibility of Nonsense's first proposition. 
to build a vessel capable of living or navigating in a heavy arctic pack into which it is proposed to put his ship the second proposition is even more hazardous involving as it does a drift of more than two thousand miles in a straight line through an unknown region during which the party in its voyage lasting two or more years we are told would take only boats along and camp on an iceberg and live there while floating across after this general greeley proceeds to prove the falsity of all my assumptions respecting the objects from the jeannette he says plainly that he does not believe in them probably some drift articles were found he says and it would seem more reasonable to trace them to the porteous which was wrecked in smith sound about one thousand miles north of ulianhob it is further important to note that if the articles were really from the jeannette the nearest route would have been not across the north pole along the east coast of greenland but down kennedy channel and by way of smith sound and baffin bay as was suggested as to drift from the porteous we could not possibly get near the pole itself by a long distance says greeley as we know almost as well as if we had seen it that there is in the unknown regions an extensive land which is the birthplace of the flat-topped icebergs or the paleocrystic ice in this glacier-covered land which he is of opinion must be over three hundred miles in diameter and which sends out icebergs to greenland as well as to franz joseph's land the pole itself must be situated as to the indestructible ship he says it is certainly a most desirable thing for dr nansen his meaning however is that it cannot be built dr nansen appears to believe that the question of building on such lines as will give the ship the greatest power of resistance to the pressure of the ice flow has not been thoroughly and satisfactorily solved although hundreds of thousands of dollars have been spent for this end by the seal and whaling companies of scotland and newfoundland as an authority he quotes melville and says every arctic navigator of experience agrees with melville's dictum that even if built solid a vessel could not withstand the ice pressure of the heavy polar pack to my assertion that the ice along the siberian coast is comparatively thin seven to ten feet he again quotes melville who speaks of ice fifty feet high etc something we did not discover by the way during the whole of our voyage after giving still more conclusive proofs that the fram must inevitably go to the bottom as soon as it should be exposed to the pressure of the ice he goes on to refer to the impossibility of drifting in the ice with boats and he concludes his article with the remark that arctic exploration is sufficiently credited with rashness and danger in its legitimate and sanctioned methods without bearing the burden of dr nonsense's illogical scheme of self-destruction from an article greeley wrote after our return home in harper's weekly for september nineteenth eighteen ninety six he appears to have come to the conclusion that the jeannette relics were genuine and that the assumption of their drift may have been correct mentioning melville dahl and others as not believing in them he also allows that my scheme has been carried out in spite of what he had said this time he concludes the article as follows in contrasting the expeditions of de long and nansen it is necessary to allude to the single blemish that mars the otherwise magnificent career of nansen who deliberately quitted his comrades on the ice-beset ship hundreds of miles from any known land with the intention of not returning but in his own reported words to go to spitzbergen where he felt certain to find a ship six hundred miles away de long and ambler had such a sense of honor that they sacrificed their lives rather than separate themselves from a dying man whom their presence could not save it passes comprehension how nansen could have thus deviated from the most sacred duty devolving on the commander of a naval expedition the safe return of brave captain sverdrup with the fram does not excuse nansen sverdrup's consistency courage and skill in holding fast to the fram and bringing his comrades back to norway 
will win for him in the minds of many laurels even brighter than those of his able and accomplished chief one of the few who publicly gave to my plan the support of his scientific authority was professor supon the well-known editor of petermann's mittelungen in an article in this journal for eighteen ninety one page one ninety one he not only spoke warmly in its favor but supported it with new suggestions his view was that what he terms the arctic windshed probably for the greater part of the year divides the unknown polar basin into two parts in the eastern part the prevailing winds blow towards the bering sea while those of the western part blow towards the atlantic he thought that as a rule this windshed must lie near the bering sea and that the prevailing winds in the tracks we proposed traversing would thus favor our drift our experience bore out professor supon's theory in a remarkable degree end of file three File four of Farthest North, Volume one. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sharon Riskadal. Farthest North by Fritjof Nansen, Volume one. Chapter two, Preparations and Equipment. Foolhardy as the scheme appeared to some, it received powerful support from the Norwegian government and the King of Norway. A bill was laid before the storting for a grant of eleven thousand two hundred fifty pounds, two hundred thousand kroner, or two-thirds of the estimated cost. The remaining third I hoped to be able to raise from private sources, as I had already received promises of support from many quarters. On June thirtieth, 1890, the amount demanded was voted by the storting, which thereby expressed its wish that the expedition should be a Norwegian one. In January 1891, Mr. Thomas Fernley, Consul Axel Heiberg, and Mr. Elif Ringness set to work to collect the further sum required, and in a few days the amount was subscribed. His Majesty King Oscar gave 1,125 pounds, 20,000 kroner, while private individuals in Norway gave as follows consul axel heiberg five hundred sixty two pounds ten shillings ditto later three hundred ninety three pounds fifteen shillings mr anton christian hewen one thousand one hundred twenty five pounds mr a dick hovick two hundred eighty one pounds five shillings ditto later three hundred ninety three pounds fifteen shillings Mr. Thomas Fernley, merchant, two hundred eighty one pounds five shillings, ditto later, fifty six pounds five shillings. Mr. Ringness and Company, brewers, two hundred eighty one pounds five shillings, ditto later, fifty six pounds five shillings. Mr. A. S. Schostrud, merchant, Drammen, two hundred eighty one pounds five shillings, ditto later, fifty six pounds five shillings. Mr. E. Sunt, Merchant, Bergen, two hundred eighty one pounds five shillings. Consul Westy Egberg, five hundred sixty two pounds ten shillings. Mr. Halver Show, two hundred eighty one pounds five shillings. Baron Harald Weddell Jarlsberg and C. Jovenschold, Minister of State, five hundred sixty two pounds ten shillings. Consul Nikolai H. Knutsen, Christiansund, two hundred eighty one pounds five shillings among foreign contributors may be mentioned the royal geographical society of london which showed its sympathy with the undertaking by subscribing three hundred pounds sterling baron oscar dixon provided at his own cost the electric installation dynamo accumulators and conductors as the work of equipment proceeded it appeared that the first estimate was not sufficient this was especially due to the ship which was estimated to cost eight thousand four hundred thirty seven pounds ten shillings one hundred fifty thousand kroner 
but which came to nearly double that sum. Where so much was at stake, I did not think it right to study the cost too much if it seemed that a little extra outlay could ensure the successful result of the expedition. The three gentlemen who had taken the lead in the first collection, Mr. Thomas Fernley, Consul Axel Heiberg, and Mr. Ella Ringness, undertook at my request to constitute themselves the committee of the expedition and to take charge of its pecuniary affairs. In order to cover a portion of the deficiency, they, together with certain members of the Council of the Geographical Society, set on foot another private subscription all over the country, while the same society at a later period headed a national subscription. By these means, about 956 pounds, five shillings, was collected in all. I had further to petition the Norwegian Storting for an additional sum of 4,500 pounds, when our National Assembly again gave proof of its sympathy with the undertaking by granting the amount named June 9, 1890. Finally, Consul Axel Heiberg and Mr. Dick subscribed an additional 337 pounds 10 shillings each, while I myself made up the deficiency that still remained on the eve of our departure. Statement of Accounts of the Expedition on its Setting Out, 1893, Income State Grant, 280,000 kroner His Majesty the King and Original Private Subscribers, 105,000 kroner Private Subscription of the Geographical Society, 12,781 kroner, 23 ora National Subscription, 2,287 kroner, 23 ora. Interest accrued, 9,729 kroner, 78 ora. Guaranteed by private individuals, 5,400 kroner. Deficit covered by A. Heiberg and A. Dick, 12,000 kroner. Ditto F. Nansen, 5,400 kroner. Geographical Society London, 300 pounds. H. Simon, Manchester, 100 pounds. A Norwegian in Riga, 1,000 rubles and others, 9,278 kroner, 62 ora. Total, 444,339 kroner, 36 ora. Nearly 25,000 pounds. Expenditure. Wages account, 46,440 kroner. Life insurance premiums of married participators, 5,361 kroner, 90 ora. Instruments account, 12,978 kroner, 68 ora. Ship account, 271,927 kroner, 8 ora. Provisions account, 39,172 kroner, 98 ora. Expenses account, 10,612 kroner, 38 ora. Equipment account, 57,846 kroner, 34 ora. Total, 44,339 kroner, 36 ora. It will be evident from the plan above expounded that the most important point in the equipment of our expedition was the building of the ship that was to carry us through the dreaded ice regions. The construction of this vessel was accordingly carried out with greater care probably than has been devoted to any ship that has hitherto ploughed the Arctic waters. I found in the well-known shipbuilder, Colin Archer, a man who thoroughly understood the task I set him, and who concentrated all his skill, foresight, and rare thoroughness upon the work. We must gratefully recognize that the success of the expedition was in no small degree due to this man. If we turn our attention to the long list of former expeditions and to their equipments, it cannot but strike us that scarcely a single vessel had been built specially for the purpose. In fact, the majority of explorers have not even provided themselves with vessels which were originally intended for ice navigation. 
this is the more surprising when we remember the sums of money that have been lavished on the equipment of some of these expeditions the fact is they have generally been in such a hurry to set out there has been no time to devote to a more careful equipment in many cases indeed preparations were not begun until a few months before the expedition sailed the present expedition however could not be equipped in so short a time and if the voyage itself took three years the preparations took no less time while the scheme was conceived thrice three years earlier plan after plan did archer make of the projected ship one model after another was prepared and abandoned fresh improvements were constantly being suggested the form we finally adhered to may seem to many people by no means beautiful but that it is well adapted to the ends in view i think our expedition has fully proved what was especially aimed at was as mentioned on page thirty to give the ship such sides that it could readily be hoisted up during ice pressure without being crushed between the flows greeley naras etc etc are certainly right in saying that this is nothing new i relied here simply on the sad experiences of earlier expeditions what however may be said to be new is the fact that we not only realized that the ship ought to have such a form but that we gave it that form as well as the necessary strength for resisting great ice pressure and that this was the guiding idea in the whole work of construction colin archer is quite right in what he says in an article in the norsk tidschrift for sovensen eighteen ninety two when one bears in mind what is so to speak the fundamental idea of dr nansen's plan in his north pole expedition it will readily be seen that a ship which is to be built with exclusive regard to its suitability for this object must differ essentially from any other previously known vessel in the construction of the ship two points must be especially studied one that the shape of the hull be such as to offer as small a vulnerable target as possible to the attacks of the ice and two that it be built so solidly as to be able to withstand the greatest possible pressure from without in any direction whatsoever and thus she was built more attention being paid to making her a safe and warm stronghold while drifting in the ice than to endowing her with speed or good sailing qualities as above stated our aim was to make the ship as small as possible the reason of this was that a small ship is of course lighter than a large one and can be made stronger in proportion to her weight a small ship too is better adapted for navigation among the ice it is easier to handle her in critical moments and to find a safe berth for her between the packing ice floes i was of opinion that a vessel of one hundred seventy tons register would suffice but the fram is considerably larger four hundred two tons gross and three hundred seven tons net it was also our aim to build a short vessel which could thread her way easily among the floes especially as great lengths would have been a source of weakness when ice pressure set in but in order that such a ship which has moreover very sloping sides shall possess the necessary carrying capacity she must be broad and her breadth is in fact about a third of her length another point of importance was to make the sides as smooth as possible without projecting edges while plain surfaces were as much as possible avoided in the neighborhood of the most vulnerable points and the hull assumed a plump and rounded form bow stern and keel all were rounded off so that the ice should not be able to get a grip of her anywhere for this reason too the keel was sunk in the planking so that barely three inches protruded and its edges were rounded the object was that the whole craft should be able to slip like an eel out of the embraces of the ice the hull was made pointed fore and aft and somewhat resembles a pilot boat minus the keel and the sharp garboard strakes both ends were made specially strong 
the stem consists of three stout oak beams one inside the other forming an aggregate thickness of four feet one and a quarter meters of solid oak inside the stem are fitted solid breast hooks of oak and iron to bind the ship sides together and from these breast hooks stays are placed against the pawl bit the bow is protected by an iron stem and across it are fitted transverse bars which run some small distance backwards on either side as is usual in sealers the stern is of a special and somewhat peculiar construction on either side of the rudder and propeller posts which are sided twenty four inches sixty five centimeters is fitted a stout oak counter timber following the curvature of the stern right up to the upper deck and forming so to speak a double stern post the planking is carried outside these timbers and the stern protected by heavy iron plates wrought outside the planking between these two counter timbers there is a well for the screw and also one for the rudder through which they can both be hoisted up on deck it is usual in sealers to have the screw arranged in this way so that it can easily be replaced by a spare screw should it be broken by the ice but such an arrangement is not usual in the case of the rudder and while with our small crew and with the help of the capstan we could hoist the rudder on deck in a few minutes in case of any sudden ice pressure or the like i have known it take sealers with a crew of over sixty men several hours or even a whole day to ship a fresh rudder the stern is on the whole the achilles heel of ships in the polar seas here the ice can easily inflict great damage for instance by breaking the rudder to guard against this danger our rudder was placed so low down as not to be visible above water so that if a flow should strike the vessel aft it would break its force against the strong stern part and could hardly touch the rudder itself as a matter of fact notwithstanding the violent pressures we met with we never suffered any injury in this respect everything was of course done to make the sides of the ship as strong as possible the frame timbers were of choice italian oak that had originally been intended for the norwegian navy and had lain under cover at horton for thirty years they were all grown to shape and ten to eleven inches thick the frames were built in two courses or tiers closely wrought together and connected by bolts some of which were riveted over each joint flat iron bands were placed the frames were about twenty one inches fifty six centimeters wide and were placed close together with only about an inch or an inch and a half between and these interstices were filled with pitch and sawdust mixed from the keel to a little distance above the water line in order to keep the ship moderately watertight even should the outer skin be chafed through the outside planking consists of three layers the inner one is of oak three inches thick fastened with spikes and carefully caulked outside this another oak sheathing four inches thick fastened with through bolts and caulked and outside these comes the ice skin of greenheart which like the other planking runs right down to the keel at the water line it is six inches thick gradually diminishing towards the bottom to three inches it is fastened with nails and jagged bolts and not with through bolts so that if the ice had stripped off the whole of the ice sheathing the hull of the ship would not have suffered any great damage the lining inside the frame timbers is of pitch pine planks some four some eight inches thick it was also carefully caulked once or twice the total thickness of the ship's sides is therefore from twenty four to twenty eight inches of solid watertight wood it will readily be understood that such a ship's side with its rounded form would of itself offer a very good resistance to the ice but to make it still stronger the inside was shored up in every possible way so that the hold looks like a cobweb of balks stanchions and braces in the first place there are two rows of beams 
the upper deck and between decks principally of solid oak partly also of pitch pine and all of these are further connected with each other as well as with the sides of the ship by numerous supports the accompanying diagrams will show how they are arranged the diagonal stays are of course placed as nearly as possible at right angles to the sides of the ship so as to strengthen them against external pressure and to distribute its force the vertical stanchions between both tiers of beams and between the lower beams and keelson are admirably adapted for this latter object all are connected together with strong knees and iron fastenings so that the whole becomes as if it were a single coherent mass it should be borne in mind that while in former expeditions it was thought sufficient to give a couple of beams amidships some extra strengthening every single crossbeam in the fram was stayed in the manner described and depicted in the engine room there was of course no space for supports in the middle but in their place two stay ends were fixed on either side the beams of the lower deck were placed a little under the water line where the ice pressure would be the severest in the after hold these beams had to be raised a little to give room for the engine the upper deck aft therefore was somewhat higher than the main deck and the ship had a poop or half deck under which were the cabins for all the members of the expedition and also the cooking galley strong iron riders were worked in for the whole length of the ship in the spaces between the beams extending in one length from the clamp under the upper deck nearly to the keelson the keelson was in two tiers and about thirty-one inches eighty centimeters high saving in the engine room where the height of the room only allows one tier the keel consists of two heavy american elm logs fourteen inches square but as has been mentioned so built in that only three inches protrude below the outer planking the sides of the hull are rounded downwards to the keel so that a transverse section at the midship frame reminds one forcibly of half a coconut cut in two the higher the ship is lifted out of the water the heavier does she of course become and the greater her pressure on the ice but for the above reason the easier also does it become for the ice to lift to obviate much heeling in case the hull should be lifted very high the bottom was made flat and this proved to be an excellent idea i endeavored to determine experimentally the friction of ice against wood and taking into account the strength of the ship and the angle of her sides with the surface of the water i came to the conclusion that her strength must be many times sufficient to withstand the pressure necessary to lift her this calculation was amply borne out by experience the principal dimensions of the ship were as follows length of keel one hundred two feet length of water line one hundred thirteen feet length from stem to stern on deck one hundred twenty eight feet extreme breadth thirty six feet breadth of water line exclusive of ice skin thirty four feet depth seventeen feet draft of water with light cargo twelve and a half feet displacement with light cargo five hundred thirty tons with heavy cargo the draft is over fifteen feet and the displacement is eight hundred tons there is a freeboard of about three feet six inches the hull with boilers filled was calculated to weigh about four hundred twenty tons and with eight hundred tons displacement there should therefore be spare carrying power for coal and other cargo to the amount of three hundred eighty tons thus in addition to the requisite provisions for dogs and men for more than five years we could carry coal for four months steaming at full speed which was more than sufficient for such an expedition as this as regards the rigging the most important object was to have it as simple and as strong as possible and at the same time so contrived as to offer the least possible resistance to the wind while the ship was under steam with our small crew it was moreover of the last importance that it should be easy to work from deck 
For this reason, the Fram was rigged as a three-masted fore and aft schooner. Several of our old Arctic skippers disapproved of this arrangement. They had always been used to sail with square-rigged ships, and with the conservatism peculiar to their class, were of opinion that what they had used was the only thing that could be used in the ice. However, the rig we chose was unquestionably the best for our purpose. In addition to the ordinary fore and aft sails, we had two movable yards on the foremast for a square foresail and topsail. As the yards were attached to a sliding truss, they could easily be hauled down when not in use. The ship's lower masts were tolerably high and massive. The main mast was about eighty feet high, the main topmast was fifty feet high, and the crow's nest on the top was about one hundred two feet thirty two meters above the water. It was important to have this as high as possible, so as to have a more extended view when it came to picking our way through the ice. The aggregate sail area was about 6,000 square feet. The ship's engine, a triple expansion, was made with particular care. The work was done at the Ockers Mechanical Factory, and engineer Norbeck deserves especial credit for its construction. With his quick insight, he foresaw the various possibilities that might occur, and took precautions against them. The triple expansion system was chosen as being the most economical in the consumption of coal, but as it might happen that one or other of the cylinders should get out of order, it was arranged, by means of separate pipes, that any of the cylinders could be cut off, and thus the other two, or, at a pinch, even one alone, could be used. In this way the engine, by the mere turning of a cock or two, could be changed at will into a compound high-pressure or low-pressure engine. Although nothing ever went wrong with any of the cylinders, this arrangement was frequently used with advantage. By using the engine as a compound one, we could, for instance, give the Fram greater speed for a short time, and when occasion demanded, we often took this means of forcing our way through the ice. The engine was of 220 indicated horsepower, and we could, in calm weather with a light cargo, attain a speed of six or seven knots. The propellers, of which we had two in reserve, were two-bladed and made of cast iron, but we never used either the spare propellers or a spare rudder which we had with us. Our quarters lay, as before mentioned, abaft under the half-deck, and were arranged so that the saloon, which formed our dining-room and drawing-room, was in the middle, surrounded on all sides by the sleeping cabins. These consisted of four staterooms with one berth apiece, and two with four berths. The object of this arrangement was to protect the saloon from external cold, but further the ceiling, floors, and walls were covered with several thick coatings of non-conducting material. The surface layer, in touch with the heat of the cabin, consisting of airtight linoleum to prevent the warm, damp air from penetrating to the other side, and depositing moisture which would soon turn to ice. The sides of the ship were lined with tarred felt, then came a space with cork padding, next a deal paneling, then a thick layer of felt, next an airtight linoleum, and last of all an inner paneling. The ceiling of the saloon and cabins consisted of many different layers. Air, felt, deal paneling, reindeer hair stuffing, deal paneling, linoleum, air and deal paneling, which, with the four-inch deck planks, gave a total thickness of about fifteen inches. To form the floor of the saloon, cork padding, six or seven inches thick, was laid on the deck planks on this a thick wooden floor, and above all, linoleum. The skylight, which was most exposed to the cold, was protected by three panes of glass, one within the other, and in various other ways. One of the greatest difficulties of life on board ship, which former Arctic expeditions had had to contend with, was that moisture collecting on the cold outside walls either froze at once or ran down in streams into the berths and onto the floor. 
thus it was not unusual to find the mattresses converted into more or less solid masses of ice we however by these arrangements entirely avoided such an unpleasant state of things and when the fire was lighted in the saloon there was not a trace of moisture on the walls even in the sleeping cabins in front of the saloon lay the cook's galley on either side of which was a companion leading to the deck as a protection against the cold each of these companionways was fitted with four small solid doors consisting of several layers of wood with felt between all of which had to be passed through on going out and the more completely to exclude the cold air the thresholds of the doors were made more than ordinarily high on the half-deck over the cook's galley between the mainmast and the funnel was a chart-room facing the bow and a smaller work-room abaft in order to secure the safety of the ship in case of a leak the hold was divided into three compartments by water-tight bulkheads besides the usual pumps we had a powerful centrifugal pump driven by the engine which could be connected with each of the three compartments it may be mentioned as an improvement on former expeditions that the fram was furnished with an electric light installation the dynamo was to be driven by the engine while we were under steam while the intention was to drive it partly by means of the wind partly by hand power during our sojourn in the ice for this purpose we took a windmill with us and also a horse mill to be worked by ourselves i had anticipated that this latter might have been useful in giving us exercise in the long polar night we found however that there were plenty of other things to do and we never used it on the other hand the windmill proved extremely serviceable for illumination when we might not have had enough power to produce electric light we took with us about sixteen tons of petroleum which was also intended for cooking purposes and for warming the cabins this petroleum as well as twenty tons of common kerosene intended to be used along with coal in the boiler was stored in massive iron tanks eight of which were in the hold and one on deck in all the ship had eight boats two of which were especially large twenty-nine feet long and nine feet wide these were intended for use in case the ship should after all be lost the idea being that we should live in them while drifting in the ice they were large enough to accommodate the whole ship's company with provisions for many months then there were four smaller boats of the form sealers generally use they were exceedingly strong and lightly built two of oak and two of elm the seventh boat was a small pram and the eighth a launch with a petroleum engine which however was not very serviceable and caused us a great deal of trouble as i shall have frequent occasion later on to speak of other details of our equipment i shall content myself here with mentioning a few of the most important special attention was of course devoted to our commissariat with a view to obviating the danger of scurvy and other ailments the principle on which i acted in the choice of provisions was to combine variety with wholesomeness every single article of food was chemically analyzed before being adopted and great care was taken that it should be properly packed such articles even as bread dried vegetables etc etc were soldered down in tins as a protection against damp a good library was of great importance to an expedition like ours and thanks to publishers and friends both in our own and in other countries we were very well supplied in this respect the instruments for taking scientific observations of course formed an important part of our equipment and special care was bestowed upon them in addition to the collection of instruments i had used on my greenland expedition a great many new ones were provided and no pains were spared to get them as good and complete as possible for meteorological observations in addition to the ordinary thermometers barometers aneroids psychrometers hygrometers anemometers etc etc self-registering instruments were also taken 
of special importance were a self-registering aneroid barometer barograph and a pair of self-registering thermometers thermographs for astronomical observations we had a large theodolite and two smaller ones intended for use on sledge expeditions together with several sextants of different sizes we had moreover four ship's chronometers and several pocket chronometers for magnetic observations for taking the declination inclination and intensity both horizontal and total intensity we had a complete set of instruments among others may be mentioned a spectroscope especially adapted for the northern lights an electroscope for determining the amount of electricity in the air photographic apparatuses of which we had seven large and small and a photographometer for making charts i considered a pendulum apparatus with its adjuncts to be of special importance to enable us to make pendulum experiments in the far north to do this however land was necessary and as we did not find any this instrument unfortunately did not come into use for hydrographic observations we took a full equipment of water samplers deep water thermometers etc to ascertain the saltness of the water we had in addition to the ordinary aerometers an electrical apparatus especially constructed by mr thorno altogether our scientific equipment was especially excellent thanks in great measure to the obliging assistance rendered me by many men of science i would take this opportunity of tendering my special thanks to professor mon who besides seeing to the meteorological instruments helped me in many other ways with his valuable advice to professor gilmudin who undertook the supervision of the astronomical instruments to dr neumeyer of hamburg who took charge of the magnetic equipment and to professor otto pedersen of stockholm and mr thorno of christiania both of whom superintended the hydrographic department of no less importance were the physiologico medicinal preparations to which professor torup devoted particular care as it might be of the utmost importance in several contingencies to have good sledge dogs i applied to my friend baron edward von toll of st petersburg and asked him whether it was possible to procure serviceable animals from siberia with great courtesy von toll replied that he thought he himself could arrange this for me as he was just on the point of undertaking his second scientific expedition to siberia and the new siberian islands he proposed to send the dogs to Khabarova on yugor strait on his journey through tumen in january eighteen ninety three by the help of an english merchant named wardroper who resided there he engaged alexander ivanovich trondheim to undertake the purchase of thirty ostiak dogs and their conveyance to yugor strait but von toll was not content with this mr nikolai kelch having offered to bear the expense my friend procured the east siberian dogs which are acknowledged to be better draught dogs than those of west siberia ostiak dogs and johann torgerson a norwegian undertook to deliver them at the mouth of the olenek where it was arranged that we should touch von toll moreover thought it would be important to establish some depots of provisions on the new siberian islands in case the fram should meet with disaster and the expedition should be obliged to return home that way on von toll's mentioning this kelch at once expressed himself willing to bear the costs as he wished us in that event to meet with siberian hospitality even on the new siberian islands as it was difficult to find trustworthy agents to carry out a task involving so much responsibility von toll determined to establish the depots himself and in may eighteen ninety three he set out on an adventurous and highly interesting journey from the mainland over the ice to the new siberian islands where besides laying down three depots for us he made some very important geological researches 
another important matter i thought was to have a cargo of coal sent out as far as possible on our route so that when we broke off all connection with the rest of the world we should have on board the fram as much coal as she could carry i therefore joyfully accepted an offer from an englishman who was to accompany us with his steam yacht to novaya zemlya or the kara sea and give us one hundred tons of coal on parting company as our departure was drawing nigh i learnt however that other arrangements had been made it being now too late to take any other measures i chartered the sloop urania of brownesund in norland to bring a cargo of coals to kabarova on the ugor strait no sooner did the plan of my expedition become known than petitions poured in by the hundred from all quarters of the earth from europe america australia from persons who wished to take part in it in spite of the many warning voices that had been raised it was no easy thing to choose among all the brave men who applied as a matter of course it was absolutely essential that every man should be strong and healthy and not one was finally accepted till he had been carefully examined by professor heilmar heiberg of christiania the following is a list of the members of the expedition otto newman sverdrup commander of the fram was born in bindal in helgeland eighteen fifty five at the age of seventeen he went to sea passed his mate's examination in eighteen seventy eight and for some years was captain of a ship in eighteen eighty eight eighty nine he took part in the greenland expedition as soon as he heard of the plan of the polar expedition he expressed his desire to accompany it and i knew that i could not place the fram in better hands he is married and has one child Sigurd Scott Hansen, first lieutenant in the Navy, undertook the management of the meteorological, astronomical, and magnetic observations. He was born in Christiania in 1868. After passing through the naval school at Horton, he became an officer in 1889 and first lieutenant in 1892. He is a son of Andreas Hansen, parish priest in Christiania. Heinrich Greve Blessing, doctor and botanist to the expedition, was born in Drammen in 1866, where his father was at that time a clergyman. He became a student in 1885 and graduated in medicine in the spring of 1893. Theodore Claudius Jakobsen, mate of the Fram, was born at Tromso in 1855, where his father was a ship's captain afterwards harbour-master and head pilot at the age of fifteen he went to sea and passed his mate's examination four years later he spent two years in new zealand and from eighteen eighty six to ninety he went on voyages to the arctic sea as skipper of a tromso sloop he is married and has one child anton amundsen chief engineer of the fram was born at horton in eighteen fifty three in 1884 he passed his technical examination and soon afterwards his engineer's examination for 25 years he has been in the navy where he attained the rank of chief engineer he is married and has six children adolf ewell steward and cook of the fram was born in the parish of scotto near Kragero in 1860 his father klaus nielsen was a farmer and shipowner in 1879 he passed his mate's examination and has been captain of a ship many years he is married and has four children lars pettersen second engineer of the fram was born in 1860 at bora near landskrona in sweden of norwegian parents he is a fully qualified smith and machinist in which capacity he has served in the norwegian navy for several years is married and has children frederick hjalmar johansen lieutenant in the reserve was born at skeen in eighteen sixty seven and matriculated at the university in eighteen eighty six in eighteen ninety one to ninety two he went to the military school and became a supernumerary officer 
he was so eager to take part in the expedition that as no other post could be found for him he accepted that of stoker peter leonard henriksen harpooner was born in balsfjord near tromso in eighteen fifty nine from childhood he has been a sailor and from fourteen years old has gone voyages to the arctic sea as harpooner and skipper in eighteen eighty eight he was shipwrecked off novaya zemlya in the sloop enig Hayden from christiansund he is married and has four children bernhard nordahl was born in christiania in eighteen sixty two at the age of fourteen he entered the navy and advanced to be a gunner subsequently he has done a little of everything and among other things has worked as an electrical engineer he had charge of the dynamo and electric installation on board acted moreover as stoker and for a time assisted in the meteorological observations he is married and has five children ivor otto ergens mogstead was born in ora in nordmora in eighteen fifty six in eighteen seventy seven passed his examination as first assistant and from eighteen eighty two onward was one of the head keepers at the gustag lunatic asylum berndt benson born in eighteen sixty went to sea for several years in eighteen ninety he passed his mate's examination since which he has sailed as mate in several voyages to the arctic sea we engaged him at tromso just as we were starting it was eight thirty when he came on board to speak to me and at ten o'clock the fram set sail end of file four file five of farthest north volume one this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Sharon Riskadal. Farthest North by Friedhof Nansen. Volume 1. Chapter 3. The Start. So travel I north to the gloomy abode that the sun never shines on. There is no day. It was midsummer day, a dull, gloomy day, and with it came the inevitable leave taking. The door closed behind me. For the last time I left my home, and went alone down the garden to the beach where the Fram's little petroleum launch pitilessly awaited me. Behind me lay all I held dear in life. And what before me? How many years would pass ere I should see it all again? What would I not have given at that moment to be able to turn back? But up at the window little Leave was sitting, clapping her hands happy child little do you know what life is how strangely mingled and how full of change like an arrow the little boat sped over lissaker bay bearing me on the first stage of a journey on which life itself if not more was staked at last everything was in readiness the hour had arrived towards which the persevering labor of years had been incessantly bent and with it the feeling that everything being provided and completed responsibility might be thrown aside and the weary brain at last find rest the fram lies yonder at pepperviken impatiently panting and waiting for the signal when the launch comes puffing past dina and runs alongside the deck is closely packed with people come to bid a last farewell and now all must leave the ship then the Fram weighs anchor, and heavily laden and moving slowly, makes the tour of the little creek. The keys are black with crowds of people waving their hats and handkerchiefs, but silently and quietly the Fram heads toward the fjord, steers slowly past Bigda and Dina out on her unknown path, while little nimble craft, steamers, and pleasure boats swarm around her peaceful and snug lay the villas along the shore behind their veils of foliage just as they ever seemed of old ah fair is the woodland slope and never did it look fairer long long will it be before we shall plough these well-known waters again and now a last farewell to home yonder it lies on the point the fjord sparkling in front pine and fir woods around 
a little smiling meadowland and long wood-clad ridges behind through the glass one could descry a summer-clad figure by the bench under the fir-tree it was the darkest hour of the whole journey and now out into the fjord it was rainy weather and a feeling of melancholy seemed to brood over the familiar landscape with all its memories it was not until noon the next day june twenty fifth that the fram glided into the bay by rakvik archer shipyard near larvik where her cradle stood and where many a golden dream had been dreamt of her victorious career here we were to take the two longboats on board and have them set up on their davits and there were several other things to be shipped it took the whole day and a good part of the next before all was completed about three o'clock on the twenty sixth we bade farewell to rakvik and made a bend into larvik bay in order to stand out to sea by frederiksvarn archer himself had to take the wheel and steer his child this last bit before leaving the ship and then came the farewell handshake but few words were spoken and they got into the boat he my brothers and a friend while the fram glided ahead with her heavy motion and the bonds that united us were severed it was sad and strange to see this last relic of home in that little skiff on the wide blue surface anker's cutter behind and larvik further in the distance i almost think a tear glittered on that fine old face as he stood erect in the boat and shouted a farewell to us and to the fram do you think he does not love the vessel that he believes in her i know well so we gave him the first salute from the fram's guns a worthier inauguration they could not well have had full speed ahead and in the calm bright summer weather while the setting sun shed his beams over the land the fram stood out towards the blue sea to get its first roll in the long heaving swell they stood up in the boat and watched us for long we bore along the coast in good weather past christiansand the next evening june twenty seventh we were off the nase i sat up and chatted with scott hansen till late in the night he acted as captain on the trip from christiania to trondheim where sverdrup was to join after having accompanied his family to stinkiar as we sat there in the chart house and let the hours slip by while we pushed on in the ever-increasing swell all at once a sea burst opened the door and poured in we rushed out on deck the ship rolled like a log the seas broke in over the rails on both sides and one by one up came all the crew i feared most lest the slender davits which supported the longboats should give way and the boats themselves should go overboard perhaps carrying away with them a lot of the rigging then twenty-five empty paraffin casks which were lashed on deck broke loose washed backwards and forwards and gradually filled with water so that the outlook was not altogether agreeable but it was worst of all when the piles of reserve timber spars and planks began the same dance and threatened to break the props under the boats it was an anxious hour seasick i stood on the bridge occupying myself in alternately making libations to neptune and trembling for the safety of the boats and the men who were trying to make snug what they could forward on deck i often saw only a hotchpotch of sea drifting planks arms legs and empty barrels now a green sea poured over us and knocked a man off his legs so that the water deluged him now i saw the lads jumping over hurtling spars and barrels so as not to get their feet crushed between them there was not a dry thread on them Ewell, who lay asleep in the grand hotel as we called one of the longboats awoke to hear the sea roaring under him like a cataract i met him at the cabin door as he came running down it was no longer safe there he thought best to save one's rags he had a bundle under his arm then he set off forward to secure his sea-chest which was floating about on the foredeck and dragged it hurriedly aft while one heavy sea after another swept over him once the fram buried her bows and shipped a sea over the forecastle 
There was one fellow clinging to the anchor davits over the frothing water. It was poor Ewell again. We were hard put to it to secure our goods and chattels. We had to throw all our good paraffin casks overboard, and one prime timber bulk after another went the same way, while I stood and watched them sadly as they floated off. The rest of the deck cargo was shifted aft on to the half-deck. I am afraid the shares in the expedition stood rather low at this moment. Then all at once, when things were about at their worst with us, we sighted a bark looming out of the fog ahead. There it lay with royals and all sails set, as snugly and peacefully as if nothing was the matter, rocking gently on the sea. It made one feel almost savage to look at it. Visions of the flying Dutchman and other devilry flashed through my mind. Terrible disaster in the cook's galley. Mogstad goes in and sees the whole wall sprinkled over with dark red stains, rushes off to Nordahl, and says he believes Ewell has shot himself through despair at the insufferable heat he complains so about. Great revolver disaster on board the Fram! On close inspection, however, the stains appeared to proceed from a box of chocolate that had upset in the cupboard. Owing to the fog, we dared not go too near land, so kept out to sea, till at last, towards morning, the fog lifted somewhat, and the pilot found his bearings between Farsund and Hammerdus. We put into Listerfjord, intending to anchor there and get into better sea trim, but as the weather improved, we went on our way. It was not till the afternoon that we steered into Eckersund, owing to thick weather and a stiff breeze, and anchored in Hovland's Bay, where our pilot, Hovland, lived. Next morning the boat davits, etc., were put in good working order. The Fram, however, was too heavily laden to be at all easy in a seaway, but this we could not alter. What we had we must keep, and if we only got everything on deck shipshape and properly lashed, the sea could not do us much harm, however rough it might be, for we knew well enough that ship and rigging would hold out. It was late in the evening of the last day of June when we rounded Kvarven and stood in for Bergen in the gloom of the sullen night. Next morning, when I came on deck, Wagen lay clear and bright in the sun, all the ships being gaily decked out with bunting from topmast to deck. The sun was holding high festival in the sky. Ulriken, Florin, and Lurvstaken sparkled and glittered and greeted me as of old. It is a marvelous place, that old Hanseatic town. In the evening I was to give a lecture, but arrived half an hour too late. For just as I was dressing to go, a number of bills poured in, and if I was to leave the town as a solvent man, I must needs pay them, and so the public perforce had to wait. But the worst of it was that the saloon was full of those everlastingly inquisitive tourists. I could hear a whole company of them besieging my cabin door while I was dressing, declaring they must shake hands with the doctor. One of them actually peeked in through the ventilator at me, my secretary told me afterwards. A nice sight she must have seen, the lovely creature. Report says she drew her head back very quickly. Indeed, at every place where we put in, we were looked on somewhat as wild animals in a menagerie for they peeped unceremoniously at us in our berths, as if we had been bears and lions in a den, and we could hear them loudly disputing among themselves as to who was who, and whether those nearest and dearest to us whose portraits hung on the walls could be called pretty or not. When I had finished my toilette, I opened the door cautiously, made a rush through the gaping company. There he is! There he is! they called out to each other as they tumbled up the steps after me. It was no use. I was on the quay and in the carriage long before they had reached the deck. At eight o'clock there was a great banquet, many fine speeches, good fare, and excellent wine, pretty ladies, music, and dancing till far into the night. Next morning at eleven o'clock, it was Sunday, in bright sunshiny weather, we stood northwards over Bergen Fjord, many friends accompanying us. It was a lovely, never-to-be-forgotten summer day. In Hurla Fjord, right out by the Skerries, they parted from us, amid wavings of hats and pocket-handkerchiefs. 
we could see the little harbor boat for a long while with its black cloud of smoke on the sparkling surface of the water outside the sea rolled in the hazy sunlight and within lay the flat mongerland full of memories for me of zoological investigations in fair weather and foul years and years ago here it was that one of norway's most famous naturalists a lonely pastor far removed from the outer world made his great discoveries here i myself first groped my way along the narrow path of zoological research it was a wondrous evening the lingering flush of vanished day suffused the northern sky while the moon hung large and round over the mountains behind us ahead lay alden and kin like a fairyland rising up from the sea tired as i was i could not seek my birth i must drink in all this loveliness in deep refreshing draughts it was like balm to the soul after the turmoil and friction with crowds of strangers so we went on our way mostly in fair weather occasionally in fog and rain through sounds and between islands northwards along the coast of norway a glorious land i wonder if another fairway like this is to be found the whole world over those never-to-be-forgotten mornings when nature wakens to life wreaths of mist glittering like silver over the mountains their tops soaring above the mist like islands out of the sea then the day gleaming over the dazzling white snow peaks and the evenings and the sunsets with the pale moon overhead white mountains and islands lay hushed and dreamlike as a youthful longing here and there passed homely little havens with houses around them set in smiling green trees ah those snug homes in the lee of the skerries awake a longing for life and warmth in the breast you may shrug your shoulders as much as you like at the beauties of nature but it is a fine thing for a people to have a fair land be it never so poor never did this seem clearer to me than now when i was leaving it every now and then a hurrah from land at one time from a troop of children at another from grown-up people but mostly from wandering peasants who gaze long at the strange-looking ship and muse over its enigmatic destination and men and women on board sloops and ten-oared boats stand up in their red shirts that glow in the sunlight and rest on their oars to look at us steamboats crowded with people came out from the towns we passed to greet us and bid us godspeed on our way with music songs and cannon salutes the great tourist steamboats dipped flags to us and fired salutes and the smaller craft did the same it is embarrassing and oppressive to be the object of homage like this before anything has been accomplished there is an old saying at the eve the day shall be praised the wife when she is burnt the sword when tried the woman when married the ice when passed over ale when drunk most touching was the interest and sympathy with which these poor fisher folk and peasants greeted us it often set me wondering i felt they followed us with fervent eagerness i remember one day it was north in helgeland an old woman was standing waving and waving to us on a bare crag her cottage lay some distance inland i wonder if it can really be us she is waving to i said to the pilot who was standing beside me you may be sure it is was the answer but how can she know who we are oh they know all about the from up here in every cabin and they will be on the lookout for you as you come back i can tell you he answered ay truly it is a responsible task we are undertaking when the whole nation are with us like this what if the thing should turn out a huge disappointment in the evening i would sit and look around lonely huts lay scattered here and there on points and islets here the norwegian people wear out their lives in the struggle with the rocks in the struggle with the sea and it is this people that is sending us out into the great hazardous unknown the very folk who stand there in their fishing boats and look wonderingly after the fram as she slowly and heavily steams along on her northward course many of them wave their sou'westers and shout hurrah 
others have barely time to gape at us in wonderment. In on the point are a troop of women waving and shouting, outside a few boats with ladies in light summer dresses and gentlemen at the oars, entertaining them with small talk, as they wave their parasols and pocket-handkerchief. Yes, it is they who are sending us out. It is not a cheering thought. Not one of them probably knows what they are paying their money for. Maybe they have heard it is a glorious enterprise. But why? To what end? Are we not defrauding them? But their eyes are riveted on the ship, and perhaps there dawns before their minds a momentary vision of a new and inconceivable world, with aspirations after a something of which they know not. And here on board are men who are leaving wife and children behind them. How sad has been the separation! What longing, what yearning await them in the coming years! And it is not for profit they do it. For honor and glory, then? These may be scant enough. It is the same thirst for achievement, the same craving to get beyond the limits of the known, which inspired this people in the saga times, that is stirring in them again today. In spite of all our toil for subsistence, in spite of all our peasant politics, sheer utilitarianism is perhaps not so dominant among us after all. As time was precious, I did not, as originally intended, put in a Trondheim, but stopped at Bayonne, where Sverdrup joined us. Here Professor Brueger also came on board to accompany us as far as Tromsø. Here, too, our doctor received three monstrous chests with the medicine supply, a gift from Apothecary Bruun of Trondheim. And so on towards the north, along the lovely coast of Nordland, we stopped at one or two places to take dried fish on board as provision for the dogs, past Torghatten, the Seven Sisters, and Hestemanden, past Lovenen and Tranen, far out yonder in the sea, past Lofoten and all the other lovely places, each bold, gigantic form wilder and more beautiful than the last. It is unique, a fairyland, a land of dreams. We felt afraid to go on too fast for fear of missing something. On July 12th we arrived at Tromsø, where we were to take in coal and other things, such as reindeer cloaks, komager, a sort of lap moccasin, fin shoes, senna, grass, dried reindeer flesh, etc., etc., all of which had been procured by that indefatigable friend of the expedition, Advocate Mac. Tromsø also gave us a cold reception, a northwesterly gale with driving snow and sleet. Mountains, plains, and house roofs were all covered with snow down to the water's edge. It was the very bitterest July day I ever experienced. The people there said they could not remember such a July. Perhaps they were afraid the place would come into disrepute, for in a town where they hold snowshoe races on midsummer day, one may be prepared for anything in the way of weather. In Tromsø the next day a new member of the expedition was engaged, Bernd Benson, a stout fellow to look at. He originally intended accompanying us only as far as Ugor Strait, but as a matter of fact he went the whole voyage with us and proved a great acquisition, being not only a capital seaman, but a cheerful and amusing comrade. After a stay of two days we again set out. On the night of the 16th, east of the North Cape, or Magaro, we met with such a nasty sea, and shipped so much water on deck, that we put into Churlefjord to adjust our cargo better by shifting the coal and making a few other changes. We worked at this the whole of two days, and made everything clear for the voyage to Novaya Zemlya. I had at first thought of taking on board a fresh supply of coal at Vardo, but as we were already deeply laden, and the Urania was to meet us at Ugor Strait with coal, we thought it best to be contented with what we had already got on board, as we might expect bad weather in crossing the White Sea and Barents Sea. At ten o'clock in the evening we weighed anchor and reached Vardo next evening, where we met with a magnificent reception. There was a band of music on the pier, the fjord teemed with boats, flags waved on every hand, and salutes were fired. 
the people had been waiting for us ever since the previous evening we were told some of them indeed coming from vadso and they had seized the opportunity to get up a subscription to provide a big drum for the town band the north pole and here we were entertained to a sumptuous banquet with speeches and champagne flowing in streams ere we bade norway our last farewell the last thing that had now to be done for the fram was to have her bottom cleaned of mussels and weeds so that she might be able to make the best speed possible this work was done by divers who were readily placed at our service by the local inspector of the government harbor department but our own bodies also claimed one last civilized feast of purification before entering on a life of savagery the bathhouse of the town is a small timber building the bathroom itself is low and provided with shelves where you lie down and are parboiled with hot steam which is constantly kept up by water being thrown on the glowing hot stones of an awful oven worthy of hell itself while all the time young quen lasses flog you with birch twigs after that you are rubbed down washed and dried delightfully everything being well managed clean and comfortable i wonder whether old father mohammed has set up a bath like this in his paradise end of file five file six of farthest north volume one this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sharon riskadal farthest north by fridtjof nansen volume one chapter four farewell to norway i felt in a strange mood as i sat up the last night writing letters and telegrams we had bidden farewell to our excellent pilot johann hagenson who had piloted us from bergen and now we were only the thirteen members of the expedition together with my secretary christopherson who had accompanied us so far and was to go on with us as far as ugor strait everything was so calm and still save for the scraping of the pen that was sending off a farewell to friends at home all the men were asleep below the last telegram was written and i sent my secretary ashore with it it was three o'clock in the morning when he returned and i called sverdrup up and one or two others we weighed anchor and stood out of the harbor in the silence of the morning the town still lay wrapped in sleep everything looked so peaceful and lovely all around with the exception of a little stir of awakening toil on board one single steamer in the harbor a sleepy fisherman stuck his head up out of the half-deck of his ten-oared boat and stared at us as we steamed past the breakwater and on the revenue cutter outside there was a man fishing in that early morning light this last impression of norway was just the right one for us to carry away with us such beneficent peace and calm such a rest for the thoughts no hubbub and turmoil of people with their hurrahs and salutes the masts in the harbor the house roofs and chimneys stood out against the cool morning sky just then the sun broke through the mist and smiled over the shore rugged bare and weather-worn in the hazy morning but still lovely dotted here and there with tiny houses and boats and all norway lay behind it while the fram was slowly and quietly working her way out to sea towards our distant goal i stood and watched the land gradually fading away on the horizon i wonder what will happen to her and to us before we again see norway rising up over the sea but a fog soon came on and obscured everything and through fog nothing but fog we steamed away for four days without stopping until when i came on deck on the morning of the twenty fifth of july behold clear weather the sun was shining in a cloudless sky the bright blue sea was heaving with a gentle swell again it was good to be a living being and to drink in the peacefulness of the sea in long draughts towards noon we sighted gooseland on novaya zemlya and stood in towards it 
guns and cartridges were got ready, and we looked forward with joyful anticipation to roast goose and other game. But we had gone but a short distance when the grey woolly fog from the southeast came up and enveloped us. Again we were shut off from the world around us. It was scarcely prudent to make for land, so we set our course eastwards towards Ugor Strait but a headwind soon compelled us to beat up under steam and sail, which we went on doing for a couple of days, plunged in a world of fog. Ugh! That endless stubborn fog of the Arctic Sea! When it lowers its curtain and shuts out the blue above and the blue below, and everything becomes a damp gray mist, day in and day out, then all the vigor and elasticity of the soul is needed to save one from being stifled in its clammy embrace. Fog and nothing but fog wherever we turn our eyes. It condenses on the rigging and drips down on every tiniest spot on deck. It lodges on your clothes and finally wets you through and through. It settles down on the mind and spirits, and everything becomes one uniform gray. On the evening of July 27th, while still fog-bound, we quite unexpectedly met with ice, a mere strip, indeed, which we easily passed through, but it boded ill. In the night we met with more, a broader strip this time, which also we passed through. But next morning I was called up with the information that there was thick old ice ahead. Well, if ice difficulties were to begin so soon, it would be a bad lookout indeed. Such are the chill surprises that the Arctic Sea has more than enough of. I dressed and was up in the crow's nest in a twinkling. The ice lay extended everywhere, as far as the eye could reach through the fog, which had lifted a little. There was no small quantity of ice, but it was tolerably open, and there was nothing for it but to be true to our watchword and ga fram push onwards. For a good while we picked our way, but now it began to lie closer with large flows every here and there, and at the same time the fog grew denser and we could not see our way at all. To go ahead in difficult ice and in a fog is not very prudent, for it is impossible to tell just where you are going, and you are apt to be set fast before you know where you are so we had to stop and wait. But still the fog grew ever denser, while the ice did the same. Our hopes meanwhile rose and fell, but mostly the latter, I think. To encounter so much ice already in these waters, where at this time of year the sea is, as a rule, quite free from it, boded anything but good. Already at Tromso and Vardo we had heard bad news, the White Sea, they said, had only been clear of ice a very short time, and a boat that had tried to reach Ugor Strait had had to turn back because of the ice. Neither were our anticipations of the Kara Sea altogether cheerful. What might we not expect there? For the Urania with our coal, too, this ice was a bad business, for it would be unable to make its way through unless it had found navigable water further south along the Russian coast. Just as our prospects were at their darkest, and we were preparing to seek a way back out of the ice which kept getting ever denser, the joyful tidings came that the fog was lifting and that clear water was visible ahead to the east on the other side of the ice. After forcing our way ahead for some hours between the heavy flows, we were once more in open water. This first bout with the ice, however, showed us plainly what an excellent ice-boat the Fram was. It was a royal pleasure to work her ahead through difficult ice. She twisted and turned like a ball on a platter, no channel between the flows so winding and awkward but she could get through it but it is hard work for the helmsman. Hard a starboard, hard a port, steady, hard a starboard, again, goes on incessantly without so much as a breathing space, and he rattles the wheel round, the sweat pours off him, and round it goes again like a spinning wheel. And the ship swings round and wriggles her way forward among the flows without touching. 
if there is only just an opening wide enough for her to slip through and where there is none she drives full tilt at the ice with her heavy plunge runs her sloping bows up on it treads it under her and bursts the floes asunder and how strong she is too even when she goes full speed at a flow not a creak not a sound is to be heard in her if she gives a little shake it is all she does on saturday july twenty ninth we again headed eastwards towards Ugor Strait, as fast as sails and steam could take us. We had open sea ahead, the weather was fine, and the wind fair. Next morning we came under the south side of Dolgoi, or Longuya as the Norwegian whalers call it, where we had to stand to the northward. On reaching the north of the island we again bore eastwards. Here I descried from the crow's nest as far as i could make out several islands which are not given on the charts they lay a little to the east of longuya it was now pretty clear that the urania had not made her way through the ice while we were sitting in the saloon in the forenoon talking about it a cry was heard from deck that the sloop was in sight it was joyful news but the joy was of no long duration the next moment we heard she had a crow's nest on her mast so she was doubtless a sealer when she sighted us she bore off to the south probably fearing that we were a russian warship or something equally bad so as we had no particular interest in her we let her go on her way in peace later in the day we neared ugor strait we kept a sharp lookout for land ahead but none could be seen hour after hour passed as we glided onwards at good speed but still no land certainly it would not be high land but nevertheless this was strange yes there it lies like a low shadow over the horizon on the port bow it is land it is vygot's island soon we sight more of it abaft the beam then to the mainland on the south side of the strait more and more of it comes in sight it increases rapidly all low and level land no heights no variety no apparent opening for the strait ahead thence it stretches away to the north and south in a soft low curve this is the threshold of asia's boundless plains so different from all we have been used to we now glided into the strait with its low rocky shores on either side the strata of the rocks lie endways and are crumpled and broken but on the surface everything is level and smooth no one who travels over the flat green plains and tundras would have any idea of the mysteries and upheavals that lie hidden beneath the sword here once upon a time were mountains and valleys now all worn away and washed out we looked out for Kabarova. On the north side of the sound there was a mark. A shipwrecked sloop lay on the shore. It was a Norwegian sealer. The wreck of a smaller vessel lay by its side. On the south side was a flagstaff, and on it a red flag. Kabarova must then lie behind it. At last one or two buildings or shanties appeared behind a promontory, and soon the whole place lay exposed to view, consisting of tents and a few houses. On a little jutting out point close by us was a large red building with white door frames of a very homelike appearance. It was indeed a Norwegian warehouse which Sibiryakov had imported from Finmarken. But here the water was shallow, and we had to proceed carefully for fear of running aground. We kept heaving the lead incessantly. We had five fathoms of water, and then four, then not much more than we needed and then it shelved to a little over three fathoms this was rather too close work so we stood out again a bit to wait till we got a little nearer the place before drawing in to the shore a boat was now seen slowly approaching from the land a man of middle height with an open kindly face and reddish beard came on board he might have been a norwegian from his appearance I went to meet him, and asked him in German if he was Trondheim. Yes, he was. 
after him there came a number of strange figures clad in heavy robes of reindeer skin which nearly touched the deck on their heads they wore peculiar boshlik like caps of rain calf skin beneath which strongly marked bearded faces showed forth such as might well have belonged to old norwegian vikings the whole scene indeed called up in my mind a picture of the viking age of expeditions to garderica and bjarmeland they were fine stalwart looking fellows these russian traders who barter with the natives giving them brandy in exchange for bearskins sealskins and other valuables and who when once they have a hold on a man keep him in such a state of dependence that he can scarcely call his soul his own es ist ein alte geschäfte doch wird sie immer neu soon too the samoyeds came flocking on board pleasant featured people of the broad asiatic type of course it was only the men who came the first question i asked trondheim was about the ice he replied that ugor strait had been open a long while and that he had been expecting our arrival every day since then with ever increasing anxiety the natives and the russians had begun to jeer at him as time went on and no fram was to be seen but now he had his revenge and was all sunshine he thought the state of the ice in the kara sea would be favorable some samoyeds had said so who had been seal hunting near the eastern entrance of the strait a day or two previously this was not very much to build upon certainly but still sufficient to make us regret that we had not got there before then we spoke of the urania of which no one of course had seen anything no ship had put in there for some time except the sealing sloop we had passed in the morning next we inquired about the dogs and learned that everything was all right with them to make sure trondheim had purchased forty dogs though i had only asked for thirty five of these from various mishaps had died during their journey one had been bitten to death two had got hung fast and had been strangled while passing through a forest etc etc one moreover had been taken ill a few days before and was still on the sick list but the remaining thirty-four were in good condition we could hear them howling and barking during this conversation we had come as near to kabarova as we dared venture and at seven in the evening cast anchor in about three fathoms of water over the supper-table trondheim told us his adventures on the way from sofa and ural to the petrora he heard that there was a dog epidemic in that locality consequently he did not think it advisable to go to the petrora as he had intended but laid his course instead direct from ural to ugor strait towards the end of the journey the snow had disappeared and in company with a reindeer caravan he drove on with his dogs over the bare plain stocks and stones and all using the sledges none the less the samoyeds and natives of northern siberia have no vehicles but sledges the summer sledge is somewhat higher than the winter sledge in order that it may not hang fast upon stones and stumps as may be supposed however summer sledging is anything but smooth work after supper we went ashore and were soon on the flat beach of kabarova the russians and the samoyeds regarding us with the utmost curiosity the first objects to attract our attention were the two churches an old venerable-looking wooden shed of an oblong rectangular form and an octagonal pavilion not unlike many summer-houses or garden pavilions that i have seen at home how far the divergence between the two forms of religion was indicated in the two mathematical figures i am unable to say it might be that the simplicity of the old faith was expressed in the simple four-sided building while the rites and ceremonies of the other were typified in the octagonal form with its double number of corners to stumble against then we must go and see the monastery skit as it was called where the six monks had lived or rather died from what people said was scurvy probably helped out by alcohol it lay over against the new church and resembled an ordinary low russian timber house the priest and his assistants were living there now and had asked trondheim to take up his quarters with them 
Trondheim therefore invited us in, and we soon found ourselves in a couple of comfortable log-built rooms with open fireplaces like our Norwegian payas. After this we proceeded to the dog camp, which was situated on a plain at some distance from the houses and tents. As we approached it, the howling and barking kept getting worse and worse. When a short distance off, we were surprised to see a Norwegian flag on the top of a pole. Trondheim's face beamed with joy as our eyes fell on it. It was, he said, under the same flag as our expedition that his had been undertaken. There stood the dogs tied up, making a deafening clamor. Many of them appeared to be well-bred animals, long-haired, snow-white, with upstanding ears and pointed muzzles. With their gentle, good-natured-looking faces, they at once ingratiated themselves in our affections. Some of them more resembled a fox, and had shorter coats, while others were black or spotted. Evidently they were of different races, and some of them betrayed by their drooping ears a strong admixture of European blood. After having duly admired the ravenous way in which they swallowed raw fish, guignard, not without a good deal of snarling and wrangling, we took a walk inland to a lake close by in search of game, but we only found an arctic gull with its brood. A channel had been dug from this lake to convey drinking water to Kabarova. According to what Trondheim told us, this was the work of the monks, about the only work probably they had ever taken in hand. The soil here was a soft clay, and the channel was narrow and shallow, like a roadside ditch or gutter. The work could not have been very arduous. On the hill above the lake stood the flagstaff which we had noticed on our arrival. It had been erected by the excellent Trondheim to bid us welcome, and on the flag itself, as I afterwards discovered by chance, was the word Vorwarts. Trondheim had been told that was the name of our ship, so he was not a little disappointed when he came on board to find it was Fram instead. I consoled him, however, by telling him they both meant the same thing, and that his welcome was just as well meant, whether written in German or Norwegian. Trondheim told me afterwards that he was by descent a Norwegian, his father having been a ship's captain from Trondheim, and his mother, an Estonian, settled at Riga. His father had been much at sea, and had died early, so the son had not learnt Norwegian. Naturally, our first and foremost object was to learn all we could about the ice in the Arctic Sea. We had determined to push on as soon as possible, but we must have the boiler put in order first, while sundry pipes and valves in the engine wanted seeing too. As it would take several days to do this, Sverdrup, Peter Henriksen, and I set out next morning in our little petroleum launch to the eastern opening of the Ugor Strait to see with our own eyes what might be the condition of the ice to the eastward. It was twenty-eight miles thither. A quantity of ice was drifting through the strait from the east, and as there was a northerly breeze, we at once turned our course northwards to get under the lee of the north shore, where the water was more open. I had the rather thankless task of acting as helmsman and engineer at one and the same time. The boat went on like a little hero, and made about six knots. Everything looked bright. But alas, good fortune seldom lasts long, especially when one has to do with petroleum launches. A defect in the circulation pump soon stopped the engine, and we could only go for short distances at a time till we reached the north shore, where after two hours' hard work I got the engines so far in order as to be able to continue our journey to the northeast through the sound between the drifting flows. We got on pretty well, except for an interruption every now and then when the engine took it into its head to come to a standstill. It caused a great deal of merriment when the stalwart Peter turned the crank to set her off again, and the engine gave a start so as nearly to pull his arms out of joint, and upset him head over heels in the boat. Every now and then a flock of long-tailed duck, Herelda glacialis, or other birds, came whizzing by us one or two of them invariably falling to our guns. We had kept along the Vygot shore, but now crossed over towards the south side of the strait. 
when about the middle of the channel i was startled by all at once seeing the bottom grow light under us and had nearly run the boat on a shoal of which no one knew anything there was scarcely more than two or three feet of water and the current ran over it like a rapid river shoals and sunken rocks abound there on every hand especially on the south side of the strait and it required great care to navigate a vessel through it near the eastern mouth of the strait we put into a little creek dragged the boat up on the beach and then taking our guns made for some high-lying land we had noticed we tramped along over the same undulating plain land with low ridges as we had seen everywhere round the Ugor Strait. A brownish-green carpet of moss and grass spread over the plain, bestrewn with flowers of rare beauty. During the long, cold Siberian winter, the snow lies in a thick mass over the tundra, but no sooner does the sun get the better of it than hosts of tiny northern flowers burst their way up through the last disappearing coating of snow, and open their modest calices, blushing in the radiant summer day that bathes the plain in its splendor. Saxifrages with large blooms, pale yellow mountain poppies, papaver nudicali, stand in bright clusters, and here and there with bluish forget-me-nots and white cloudberry flowers. In some boggy hollows, the cotton grass spreads its wavy down carpet, while in other spots small forests of bluebells softly tingle in the wind on their upright stalks. These flowers are not at all brilliant specimens, being in most cases not more than a couple of inches high. But they are all the more exquisite on that account, and in such surroundings their beauty is singularly attractive while the eye vainly seeks for a resting place over the boundless plain these modest blooms smile at you and take the fancy captive after we had proceeded a short distance we became aware of a white object sitting on a stone heap beneath a little ridge and soon noticed more in other directions they looked quite ghostly as they sat there silent and motionless with the help of my field glass, I discovered that they were snow owls. We set out after them, but they took care to keep out of the range of a fowling piece. Sverdrup, however, shot one or two with his rifle. There was a great number of them. I could count as many as eight or ten at once. They sat motionless on tussocks of grass or stones, watching, no doubt, for lemmings, of which, judging from their tracks, there must have been quantities— we, however, did not see any. From the tops of the ridges we could see over the Kara Sea to the northeast. Everywhere ice could be descried through the telescope, far on the horizon. Ice, too, that seemed tolerably close and massive. But between it and the coast there was open water, stretching like a wide channel, as far as the eye could reach to the southeast. This was all we could make out, but it was, in reality, all we wanted. There seemed to be no doubt that we could make our way forward, and, well satisfied, we returned to our boat. Here we lighted a fire of driftwood and made some glorious coffee. As the coffee kettle was singing over a splendid fire, and we stretched ourselves at full length on the slope by its side and smoked a quiet pipe, Sverdrup made himself thoroughly comfortable, and told us one story after another. However gloomy a country might look, however desolate, if only there were plenty of driftwood on the beach, so that one could make a right good fire, the bigger the better, then his eyes would glisten with delight. That land was his El Dorado. So from that time forth he conceived a high opinion of the Siberian coast— a right good place for wintering, he called it. On our way back we ran at full speed on to a sunken rock. After a bump or two the boat slid over it, but just as she was slipping off on the other side the propeller struck on the rock so that the stern gave a bound into the air while the engine whizzed round at a tearing rate. It all happened in a second before I had time to stop her. Unluckily one screw blade was broken off, but we drove ahead with the other as best we could. Our progress was certainly rather uneven, but for all that we managed to get on somehow. 
Towards morning we drove near the Fram, passing two Samoyeds who had drawn their boat up on an ice floe and were looking out for seals. I wonder what they thought when they saw our tiny boats shoot by them without steam, sails, or oars. We, at all events, looked down on those poor savages with the self-satisfied compassion of Europeans as comfortably seated we dashed past them. But pride comes before a fall. We had not gone far when whir, 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 a fearful racket, bits of broken steel springs whizzed past my ears, and the whole machine came to a dead stop. It was not to be moved either forwards or backwards. The vibration of the one-bladed propeller had brought the lead line little by little within the range of the flywheel, and all at once the whole line was drawn into the machinery and got so dreadfully entangled in it that we had to take the whole thing to pieces to get it clear once more. So we had to endure the humiliation of rowing back to our proud ship for those flesh pots we had long been and hungered. The net result of the day was tolerably good news about the Kara Sea. Forty birds, principally geese and long-tailed ducks, one seal, and a disabled boat. Amundsen and I, however, soon put this in complete repair again, but in so doing I fear I forfeited forever and a day the esteem of the Russians and the Samoyeds in these parts. Some of them had been on board in the morning and seen me hard at work in the boat in my shirt-sleeves, face and bare arms dirty with oil and other messes. They went on shore afterwards to Trondheim and said that I could not possibly be a great person, slaving away like any other workman on board, and looking worse than a common rough. Trondheim, unfortunately, knew nothing that could be said in my excuse. There is no fighting against facts. In the evening some of us went on shore to try the dogs. Trondheim picked out ten of them and harnessed them to a Samoyed sledge. No sooner were we ready, and I had taken my seat, than the team caught sight of a wretched, strange dog that had come near, and off dashed dogs, sledge, and my valuable person after the poor creature. There was a tremendous uproar. All the ten tumbled over each other like wild wolves, biting and tearing wherever they could catch hold. Blood ran in streams, and the culprit howled pitiably, while Trondheim tore round like a madman striking right and left with his long switch. Samoyeds and Russians came screaming from all sides. I sat passively on the sledge in the middle of it all, dumb with fright, and it was ever so long before it occurred to me that there was perhaps something for me too to do. With a horrible yell I flung myself on some of the worst fighters, got hold of them by the neck, and managed to give the culprit time to get away. Our team had got badly mixed up during the battle, and it took some time to disentangle them. At last everything was once more ready for the start. Trondheim cracked his whip and called purr, purr, and off we went at a wild gallop over grass, clay, and stones, until it seemed as if they were going to carry us right across the lagoon at the mouth of the river. I kicked and pulled in with all my might, but was dragged along, and it was all that Trondheim and I, with our united strength, could do to stop them just as they were going into the water, although we shouted, Sas! Sas! so that it echoed over the whole of Kabarova. But at last we got our team turned in another direction, and off we set again merrily at such a pace that I had enough to do to hold on. It was an extraordinary summer ride, and it gave us a high opinion of the dog's strength, seeing how easily they drew two men over this, to put it mildly, bad sledging ground. We went on board again well satisfied, also the richer, by a new experience, having learnt that dog-driving, at any rate to begin with, requires much patience. Siberian dog-harness is remarkably primitive. A thick rope or a strap of sailcloth passes round the animal's back and belly. This is held in its place above by a piece of cord attached to the collar. The single trace is fastened under the belly, goes back between the legs, and must often plague the animal. I was unpleasantly surprised when I noticed that, with four exceptions, all the dogs were castrated, and this surprise I did not conceal. 
but Trondheim, on his side, was at least equally astonished, and informed me that in Siberia castrated dogs are considered the best. This was a disappointment to me, as I had reckoned on my canine family increasing on the way. For the present I should just have to trust the four whole dogs, and Kvik, the bitch I had brought with me from home. Next day, August 1st, there was a great religious festival in Kabarova, that of St. Elias. Samoyeds from far and near had come in with their reindeer teams to celebrate the day by going to church and then getting roaring drunk. We were in need of men in the morning to help with filling the boiler with fresh water, and the tank with drinking water, but on account of this festival it was difficult to get hold of any at all. At last, by dint of promising sufficient reward, Trondheim succeeded in collecting some poor fellows who had not money enough to drink themselves as drunk as the day required of them. I was on shore in the morning partly to arrange about the provision of water, partly to collect fossils in which the rock here abounds, especially one rock below Siberiakov's warehouse. I also took a walk up the hill to the west, to Trondheim's flagstaff, and looked out to the sea in that direction after the Urania but there was nothing to be seen except an unbroken sea-line. Loaded with my find, I returned to Kabarova, where I, of course, took advantage of the opportunity to see something of the festival. From early morning the women had been dressed in their finest clothes, brilliant colors, skirts with many tucks, and great colored bows at the end of plates of hair which hung far down their backs. Before service, an old Samoyed and a comely young girl led out a lean reindeer which was to be offered to the church, to the old church, that is to say. Even up here, as already mentioned, religious differences have found their way. Nearly all the Samoyeds in these parts belong to the old faith and attend the old church. But they go occasionally to the new one, too as far as I could make out, so as not to offend the priest and Siberiakov, or perhaps to be sure of heaven? From what I got out of Trondheim on the subject, the chief difference between the two religions lies in the way they make the sign of the cross, or something of that sort. Today was high festival in both churches. All the Samoyeds first paid a short visit to the new church, and then immediately streamed over into the old one. The old church was for the moment without a priest, but to-day they had clubbed together and offered the priest of the new church two roubles to hold a service in the old one, too. After careful consideration he agreed, and in all his priestly pomp crossed the old threshold. The air inside was so bad that I could not stand it for more than two minutes, so I now made my way on board again. During the afternoon the howling and screaming began, and increased as time went on. We did not need to be told that the serious part of the festival had now begun. Some of the Samoyeds tore about over the plain with their reindeer teams like furious animals. They could not sit on their sledges, but lay on them or were dragged behind them, howling. Some of my comrades went on shore and brought back anything but an edifying account of the state of things. Every single man and woman appeared to be drunk, reeling about the place. One young Samoyed in particular had made an ineffaceable impression on them. He mounted a sledge, lashed at the reindeer, and drove amuck in among the tents, over the tied-up dogs, foxes, and whatever came in his way. He himself fell off the sledge, was caught in the reins, and dragged behind, shrieking through sand and clay. Good St. Elias must be much flattered by such homage. Towards morning the howling gradually died away, and the whole town slept the loathsome sleep of the drunkard. There was not a man to be got to help with our coal-shifting the next day. Most of them slept all day after the orgy of the night. We had just to do without help, but we had not finished by evening, and I began to be impatient to get away. Precious time was passing. I had long ago given up on the Urania. We did not really need more coal. The wind had been favorable for several days. It was a south wind which was certainly blowing the ice to the northward in the Kara Sea. 
Sverdrup was now positive that we should be able to sail in open water all the way to the new Siberian islands, so it was his opinion that there was no hurry for the present. But hope is a frail reed to lean on, and my expectations were not quite so bright, so I hurried things on to get away as soon as possible. At the supper-table this evening, King Oscar's gold medal of merit was solemnly presented to Trondheim in recognition of the great care with which he had executed his difficult commission, and the valuable assistance thereby rendered to the expedition. His honest face beamed at the sight of the beautiful medal and the bright ribbon. Next day, August 3rd, we were at last ready for a start and the thirty-four dogs were brought on board in the afternoon with great noise and confusion. They were all tied up on the deck forward, and began by providing more musical entertainment than we desired. By evening the hour had come. We got up steam, everything was ready. But such a thick fog had set in that we could not see the land. Now came the moment when our last friend, Christofferson, was to leave the ship. We supplied him with the barest sufficiency of provisions, and some Ringness's ale. While this was being done, last lines were added in feverish eagerness to the letters home. Then came a last hand clasp. Christofferson and Trondheim got into the boat, and had soon disappeared in the fog. With them went our last post. Our last link with home was broken. We were alone in the mist on the sea. It was not likely that any message from us would reach the world before we ourselves brought the news of our success or defeat. How much anxiety were those at home to suffer between now and then? It is true we might possibly be able to send letters home from the mouth of the Olenek, where, according to the agreement with Baron Toll, we were to call in for another supply of dogs, but I did not consider this probable. It was far on in the summer, and I had an instinctive feeling that the state of the ice was not so favorable as I could have wished it to be. Trondheim's Narrative Alexander Ivanovich Trondheim has himself given an account, in the Tobolsk official newspaper, of his long and difficult journey with our dogs. The account was written by A. Krylov from Trondheim's story. The following is a short resume. After having made the contract with Baron Toll, Trondheim was on January 28th, January 16th, by Russian reckoning, already at Berezov, where there was then a Yasek meeting, and consequently a great assembly of Ostiaks and Samoyeds. Trondheim made use of this opportunity, and bought thirty-three, this ought probably to be forty, choice sledge-dogs. These he conveyed to the little country town of Muzi where he made preparations for the very long journey, passing the time in this way till April 16th. By this date he had prepared 300 pud, about 9,600 pounds, of dog provender, consisting chiefly of dried fish. For 300 roubles he engaged a Syrian named Terentioff, with a reindeer herd of 450, to convey him, his dogs, and baggage to Ugor Strait. For three months these two with their caravan, reindeer, drivers, dogs, women, and children, traveled through the barren tracts of northern Siberia. At first their route lay through the Ural Mountains. It was more a sort of nomadic life than a journey. They did not go straight on towards their destination, but wandered over wide tracts of country, stopping wherever it was suitable for the reindeer and where they found lichen. From the little town of Muzi, the expedition passed up the Voikara River to its sources, and here began the ascent of the Ural Mountains by the Pass of Shaila, Shola. In their crossing of the chain they tried to skirt along the foot of the mountains, climbing as little as possible. They noticed one marked contrast between the mountains in the northern and those in the southern part of the Ural chain. In the south, the snow melts quickly in the lower regions and remains lying on the tops. Here in the northern Ural, on the contrary, the mountain tops are free from snow before the sun's rays penetrate into the valleys and melt it there. 
in some valleys especially those closed by mountains to the south and more exposed to north winds the snow lies the whole summer when they had got across the ural mountains they first followed the course of the river lemva then crossed it and now followed a whole system of small rivers for which even the natives have no names at last on may fourth the expedition reached the river usa on the banks of which lay the hut of the syrian nikitska this was the one inhabited spot in this enormous tract of country and here they stopped two weeks to rest the reindeer and get provender for them the country lying between the sources of the Waikara and the usa is wooded in every direction between the river usa and the river vorkuta and even beyond that trondheim and his company travelled through quite luxuriant wood in the middle of may as the caravan approached the tundra region the wood got thinner and thinner and by may twenty seventh it was nothing but scattered underwood after this came quite small bushes and weeds and then at last the interminable tundra came in sight not to be without fuel on the tundra they felled some dead trees and other wood eight sledge loads the day after they got out on the tundra may twenty ninth the caravan set off at full speed the syrians being anxious to get quickly past a place where a whole herd of reindeer had perished some years before the reindeer drivers take good note of such places and do everything possible to avoid them as the animals may easily be infected by gnawing the bones of their dead comrades god help the herd that this happens to the disease passes rapidly from animal to animal and scores may die of it in a day in this region there are many bogs the lowland forms one continuous morass sometimes we had to walk up to the waist in water thus on june fifth we splashed about the whole day in water in constant fear of the dogs catching cold on the sixth a strong northeast wind blew and at night the cold was so severe that two reindeer calves were frozen to death and besides this two grown ones were carried off by wolves the caravan had often to cross rapid rivers where it was sometimes very difficult to find a ford they were frequently obliged to construct a bridge with the help of tent poles and sometimes blocks of ice and it occasionally took them a whole day to get across by degrees their supply of wood was used up and it was difficult to get food cooked few bushes were to be found on june seventeenth they met a syrian reindeer driver and trader from him they bought two bottles of wine brandy at seventy kopecks each it was as is customary a very friendly encounter and ended with treatings on both sides one can see a long way on the tundra the syrian's keen eye detects another herd or smoke from inhabited tents ten versts off and a nomad who has discovered the presence of another human being ten or twelve versts off never lets slip the opportunity of visiting him in his camp having a talk and being regaled with tea or in preference brandy the day after june eighteenth some samoyeds who had heard of the caravan came on four sledges to the camp they were entertained with tea the conversation carried on in samoyed was about the health of the reindeer our journey and the way to ugor strait when the scanty news of the tundra had been well discussed they took their departure by the end of june when they had got through all the ramifications of the little ural mountains the time was drawing near when according to his agreement trondheim was due at ugor strait he was obliged to hasten the rate of travelling which was not an easy matter with more than forty sledges and four hundred fifty reindeer not counting the calves he therefore determined to divide the caravan into two parts leave the women children and domestic animals behind and push forward without any baggage except the necessary food so on june twenty eighth thirty sledges tents etc were left with the women and children who were to live their nomadic life as best they could the male syrians took ten sledges and went on with trondheim at last on july ninth after more wanderings they saw the sea from a high hill 
and next day they reached Kabarova, where Trondheim learned that no steamer had arrived yet in Yurgor Strait, nor had any sail been seen. At this time the whole shore of Yurgor Strait and all the sea within sight was covered with ice, driven there by northerly winds. The sea was not quite open till July 22nd. Trondheim passed the time while he was waiting for the Fram in hunting and making excursions with his dogs, which were in excellent condition. He was often in the Sibiryakov colony, a meeting place for the Samoyeds of the district, who come here in considerable numbers to dispose of their wares. And it was a melancholy phase of life he saw here in this little world-forsaken colony every summer two or three merchants or peasant traders generally from pustazersk come for the purpose of bartering with the samoyeds and sometimes the syrians too for their wares bearskins blubber and sealskins reindeer skins and such like giving in exchange tea sugar flour household utensils etc no transaction takes place without the drinking of brandy for which the samoyed has an insatiable craving when the trader has succeeded in making a poor rich quite tipsy he fleeces him and buys all he wants at some ridiculous price the result of the transaction generally being that zasamoyed is in debt to his benefactor all the traders that come to the colony bring brandy and one great drinking bout goes on all the summer you can tell where much business is done by the number of brandy casks in the trader's booth there is no police inspection, and it would be difficult to organize anything of the kind. As soon as there is snow enough for the sledges, the merchants' reindeer caravans start from the colony on their homeward journey, loaded with empty brandy casks and with the proceeds of this one-sided bartering. On July 30th, this ought to be the 29th, Trondheim saw from the shore first smoke and soon after a steamer, there could be no doubt of its being the Fram. He went out in a little Samoyed boat to meet her, and called out in Russian that he wanted to be taken on board. From the steamer they called back, asking who he was, and when they heard his name he was hauled up. On deck he met Nansen himself, in a greasy working jacket. He is still quite a young man, of middle height. Here follows a flattering description of the leader of the expedition and the state of matters on board. It is evident, he then goes on, that we have here one family, united and inspired by one idea, for the carrying out of which all labor devotedly. The hard and dirty work on board is fairly divided, no difference being made between the common sailor and the captain, or even the chief of the expedition. The doctor, too, takes his share in the general work, and this community of labor is a close bond between all on board. The existence of such relations among the ship's company made a very favorable impression on Trondheim, and this most of all, in his opinion, justified the hope that in difficult crisis the expedition would be able to hold its own. A. I. Trondheim was on board the Fram every day, breakfasting and dining there. From what he relates, the ship must be admirably built, leaving nothing whatever to be desired. The cabins are roomy and comfortably fitted up. There is an excellent library containing the classics of European literature. Various musical instruments, from a beautiful grand piano to flutes and guitars, then chess, draughts, etc., all for the recreation of the company. Here follows a description of the Fram, her general equipments, and commissariat. It seems to have made a great impression on him that we had no wine, brandy, on board. I was told, he exclaims, that only among the medicine stores have they some twenty or thirty bottles of the best cognac, pure, highly rectified spirit. It is Nansen's opinion that brandy drinking in these northern regions is injurious, and may, if indulged in, on such a difficult and dangerous voyage, have very serious consequences. He has therefore considered it expedient to supply its place by fruit and various sorts of sweets, of which there are large supplies on board. In harbor the crew spent most of the day together. In spite of community of work, each individual's duties are fixed down to the minutest detail. 
They all sit down to meals together, with the exception of the acting cook, whose duty they take by turns. Health and good spirits are to be read on every face. Nonsense's immovable faith in a successful and happy issue to their expedition inspires the whole crew with courage and confidence. On August 3rd they shifted coal on board the Fram, from the ship's hold down to the stokehold, coal bunkers. All the members of the expedition took part in this work. Nansen at their head, and they worked unitedly and cheerfully. This same day Nansen and his companions tried the dogs on shore. Eight, this should be ten, were harnessed to a sledge, on which three persons took their places. Nansen expressed his satisfaction with the dogs, and thanked Trondheim for the good selection he had made, and for the excellent condition the animals were in. When the dogs were taken over and brought on board, Trondheim applied to Nansen for a certificate of the exact and scrupulous way in which he had fulfilled his contract. Nansen's answer was, no, a certificate is not enough. Your duty has been done with absolute conscientiousness, and you have thereby rendered a great service to the expedition. I am commissioned to present you with a gold medal from our king in recognition of the great help you have given us. With these words Nansen handed to Trondheim a very large gold medal with a crown on it. On the obverse is the following inscription, Oscar the Second, King of Norway and Sweden, for the welfare of the brother nations, and on the reverse, reward for valuable service, A. I. Trondheim. Along with this, Nansen also gave Trondheim a written testimonial as to the admirable manner in which he had carried out his commission, mentioning that for this he had been rewarded with a medal. Nansen determined to weigh anchor during the night of this same day, and set sail on his long voyage without waiting for the coal sloop Urania, which he thought must have been delayed by the ice. In the evening Trondheim took leave of the whole party, with hearty wishes for the success of the expedition. Along with him, Herr Ole Christofferson, correspondent of one of the chief London newspapers, left the ship. He had accompanied Nansen from Vardo. At parting, Nansen gave them a plentiful supply of provisions, Christofferson and Trondheim having to await the arrival of the Urania, as they were to go home by her. Precisely at twelve o'clock on the night between August 4th and 5th, the signal for starting was given, and the Fram stood out to sea. On August 7th, the Urania at last arrived. As I had supposed, she had been stopped by ice, but had at last got out of it uninjured. Christofferson and Trondheim were able to sail for home in her on the 11th, and reached Vardo on the 22nd, food having been very scarce during the last part of the time. The ship, which had left her home port, Brono, in May, was not provided for so long a voyage, and these last days they lived chiefly on dry biscuits, water, and weevils. End of File 6《File 7 of Farthest North, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sharon Riskadal. Farthest North by Fritjof Nansen, Volume 1. Chapter 5 Voyage Through the Kara Sea, Part 1. It was well into the night after Christofferson and Trondheim had left us before we could get away. The channel was too dangerous for us to risk it in the thick fog but it cleared a little, and the petroleum launch was got ready. I had determined to go on ahead with it and take soundings. We started about midnight. Hansen stood in the bow with the lead line. First we bore over towards the point of Vygots to the northwest, as Polander directs, then on through the strait, keeping to the Vygot side. The fog was often so thick that it was with difficulty we could catch a glimpse of the Fram, which followed close behind us, and on board the Fram they could not see our boat. But so long as we had enough water, and so long as we saw that they were keeping to the right course behind us, we went ahead. 
Soon the fog cleared again a little, but the depth was not quite satisfactory. We had been having steadily four and a half to five fathoms, then it dropped to four, and then to three and a half. This was too little. We turned and signaled to the Fram to stop. Then we held farther out from land and got into deeper water, so that the Fram could come on again at full speed. From time to time our petroleum engine took to its old tricks and stopped. I had to pour in more oil to set it going again, and as I was standing doing this, the boat gave a lurch, so that a little oil was spilt and took fire. The burning oil ran over the bottom of the boat where a good deal had been spilt already. In an instant the whole stern was in a blaze, and my clothes, which were sprinkled with oil, caught fire. I had to rush to the bow, and for a moment the situation was a critical one, especially as a big pail that was standing full of oil also took fire. As soon as I had stopped the burning of my clothes, I rushed aft again, seized the pail, and poured the flaming oil into the sea, burning my fingers badly. At once the whole surface of the water round was in flames. Then I got hold of the baler and bailed water into the boat as hard as I could, and soon the worst was over. Things had looked anything but well from the Fram, however, and they were standing by with ropes and buoys to throw to us. Soon we were out of Ugor Strait. There was now so little fog that the low land round us was visible, and we could also see a little way out to sea, and in the distance all drift ice. At four o'clock in the morning, August 4th, we glided past Solakai, or Hawk Island, out into the dreaded Kara Sea. Now our fate was to be decided. I had always said that if we could get safely across the Kara Sea, and past Cape Chaluskin, the worst would be over. Our prospects were not bad, an open passage to the east along the land, as far as we could see from the masthead. An hour and a half later we were at the edge of the ice. It was so close that there was no use in attempting to go on through it. To the northwest it seemed much looser, and there was a good deal of blue in the atmosphere at the horizon there. We kept southeast along the land through broken ice, but in the course of the day went further out to sea, the blueness of the atmosphere to the east and northeast promising more open water in that direction. However, about 3 p.m., the ice became so close that I thought it best to get back into the open channel along the land. It was certainly possible that we might have forced our way through the ice in the sea here, but also possible that we might have stuck fast, and it was too early to run this risk. Next morning, August 5th, being then off the coast near the mouth of the river Kara, we steered across towards Yalmal. We soon had that low land in sight, but in the afternoon we got into fog and close ice. Next day it was no better, and we made fast to a great ice block which was lying stranded off the Yalmal coast. In the evening some of us went on shore. The water was so shallow that our boat stuck fast a good way from the beach, and we had to wade. It was a perfectly flat, smooth sand beach, covered by the sea at full tide, and beyond that a steep sand bank, thirty to forty feet, in some places probably sixty feet high. We wandered about a little, flat bare country on every hand. Any driftwood we saw was buried in the sand and soaking wet. Not a bird to be seen except one or two snipe. We came to a lake, and out of the fog in front of me I heard the cry of a loon, but saw no living creature. Our view was blocked by a wall of fog whichever way we turned. There were plenty of reindeer tracks, but of course they were only those of the Samoyeds' tame reindeer. This is the land of the Samoyeds, and oh, but it is desolate and mournful. The only one of us that bagged anything was the botanist. Beautiful flowers smiled to us here and there among the sand mounds, the one message from a brighter world in this land of fogs. We went far in over the flats, but came only to sheets of water with low spits running out into them and ridges between. We often heard the cry of loons on the water, but could never catch sight of one. All these lakelets were of a remarkable, exactly circular conformation, with steep banks all round, 
just as if each had dug out a hole for itself in the sandy plain. With the oars of our boat and a large tarpaulin we had made a sort of tent. We were lucky enough to find a little dry wood, and soon the tent was filled with the fragrant odor of hot coffee. When we had eaten and drunk and our pipes were lit, Johansen, in spite of fatigue and a full meal, surprised us by turning one somersault after another on the heavy damp sand in front of the tent in his long military cloak and sea boots half full of water. By six thirty next morning we were on board again. The fog had cleared, but the ice, which lay drifting backwards and forwards, according to the set of the tide, looked as close as ever towards the north. During the morning we had a visit from a boat with two stalwart Samoyeds, who were well received and treated to food and tobacco. They gave us to understand that they were living in a tent some distance inland and farther north. Presently they went off again, enriched with gifts. These were the last human beings we met. Next day the ice was still close, and as there was nothing else to be done, some of us went ashore again in the afternoon, partly to see more of this little-known coast, and partly, if possible, to find the Samoyed's camp and get hold of some skins and reindeer flesh. It is a strange, flat country, nothing but sand, sand everywhere. Still flatter, still more desolate than the country about Yugor Strait, with a still wider horizon. Over the plain lay a green carpet of grass and moss, here and there spoiled by the wind having torn it up and swept sand over it. But trudge as we might, and search as we might, we found no Samoyed camp. We saw three men in the far distance, but they went off as fast as they could the moment they caught sight of us. There was little game, just a few ptarmigan, golden plovers, and long-tailed ducks. Our chief gain was another collection of plants and a few geological and geographical notes. Our observations showed that the land at this place was charted not less than half a degree or thirty-six to thirty-eight minutes too far west. It was not till next afternoon, August ninth, that we went on board again. The ice to the north now seemed to be rather looser, and at eight p.m. we at last began once more to make our way north. We found ice that was easy to get through, and held on our course until three days later we got into open water. On Sunday, August 18th, we stood out into the open Kara Sea, past the north point of Yalmal and Beloy Ostrov, White Island. There was no ice to be seen in any direction. During the days that followed we had constant strong east winds, often increasing to half a gale. We kept on tacking to make our way eastward, but the broad and keelless Fram can hardly be called a good beater. We made too much leeway, and our progress was correspondingly slow. In the journal there is a constantly recurring entry of headwind, headwind. The monotony was extreme, but as they may be of interest as relating to the navigation of this sea, I shall give the most important items of the journal, especially those regarding the state of the ice. On Monday, August 14th, we beat with only sail against a strong wind. Single pieces of ice were seen during the middle watch, but after that there was none within sight. Tuesday, August 15th, the wind slackened in the middle watch. We took in sail and got up steam. At five in the morning we steamed away east over a sea perfectly clear of ice, but after midday the wind began to freshen again from east-northeast, and we had to beat with steam and sail. Single flows of ice were seen during the evening and night. Wednesday, August 16th. As the Kara Sea seemed so extraordinarily free from ice, and as a heavy sea was running from the northeast, we decided to hold north as far as we could, even if it should be to the Einsamkeit Lonely Island. But about half-past three in the afternoon we had a strip of close ice ahead, so that we had to turn, stiff breeze and sea, kept on beating east along the edge of the ice, almost lost the petroleum launch in the evening. The waves were constantly breaking into it and filling it, the gunwale was burst in at two places, and the heavy davits it hung on were twisted as if they had been copper wires. 
only just in the nick of time with the waves washing over us some of us managed to get it lashed to the side of the ship there seemed to be some fatality about this boat thursday august seventeenth still beating eastward under sail and steam through scattered ice and along a margin of fixed ice still blowing hard with a heavy sea as soon as we headed a little out from the ice friday august eighteenth continued storm stood southeast at four thirty a m sverdrup who had gone up into the crow's nest to look out for bears and walrus on the ice floes saw land to the south of us at ten a m i went up to look at it we were then probably not more than ten miles away from it it was low land seemingly of the same formation as yalmal with steep sandbanks and grass grown above the sea grew shallower as we neared it not far from us small icebergs lay aground the lead showed steadily less and less water by eleven thirty a m there were only some eight fathoms then to our surprise the bottom suddenly fell to twenty fathoms and after that we found steadily increasing depth between the land and the blocks of stranded ice on our lee there appeared to be a channel with rather deeper water and not so much ice aground in it it seemed difficult to conceive that there should be undiscovered land here where both nordenskjold and edward johansen and possibly several russians had passed without seeing anything our observations however were incontestable and we immediately named the land sverdrup's island after its discoverer as there was still a great deal of ice to windward we continued our southwesterly course keeping as close to the wind as possible the weather was clear and at eight o'clock we sighted the mainland with dixon's island ahead it had been our intention to run in and anchor here in order to put letters for home under a cairn captain wiggins having promised to pick them up on his way to yenisei but in the meantime the wind had fallen it was a favorable chance and time was precious so gave up sending our post and continued our course along the coast the country here was quite different from yalmal though not very high it was a hilly country with patches and even large drifts of snow here and there some of them lying close down by the shore next morning i sighted the southernmost of the kamini islands we took a tack in under it to see if there were animals of any kind but could catch sight of none the island rose evenly from the sea at all points with steep shores they consisted for the most part of rock which was partly solid partly broken up by the action of the weather into heaps of stones it appeared to be a stratified rock with strongly marked oblique strata the island was also covered with quantities of gravel sometimes mixed with larger stones the whole of the northern point seemed to be a sand heap with steep sand banks toward the shore the most noticeable feature of the island was its marked shorelines near the top there was a specially pronounced one which was like a sharp ledge on the west and north sides and stretched across the island like a dark band nearer the beach were several other distinct ones in form they all resembled the upper one with its steep ledges and had evidently been formed in the same way by the action of the sea and more especially of the ice like the upper one they also were most marked on the west and north sides of the island which are those facing most to the open sea to the student of the history of the earth these marks of the former level of the sea are of great interest showing as they do that the land has risen or the sea sunk since the time they were formed like scandinavia the whole of the north coast of siberia has undergone these changes of level since the great ice age it was strange that we saw none of the islands which according to nordenskjold's map stretch in a line to the northeast from the kamini island on the other hand i took the bearings of one or two other islands lying almost due east and next morning we passed a small island farther north we saw a few birds in this neighborhood only a few flocks of geese some arctic gulls lestris parasitica and l bufoni 
and a few seagulls and tern on sunday august twentieth we had for us uncommonly fine weather blue sea brilliant sunshine and light wind still from the northeast in the afternoon we ran into the chelman islands these we could recognize from their position on nordenskjold's map but south of them we found many unknown ones they all had smoothly rounded forms these chelman islands like rocks that have been ground smooth by the glaciers of the ice age the fram anchored on the north side of the largest of them and whilst the boiler was being refitted some of us went ashore in the evening for some shooting we had not left the ship when the mate from the crow's nest caught sight of reindeer at once we were all agog every one wanted to go ashore and the mate was quite beside himself with the hunter's fever his eyes as big as saucers and his hands trembling as though he were drunk not until we were in the boat had we time to look seriously for the mate's reindeer we looked in vain not a living thing was to be seen in any direction yes when we were close in shore we at last descried a large flock of geese waddling upward from the beach we were base enough to let a conjecture escape us that these were the mate's reindeer a suspicion which he at first rejected with contempt gradually however his confidence oozed away but it is possible to do an injustice even to a mate the first thing i saw when i sprang ashore was old reindeer tracks the mate had now the laugh on his side ran from track to track and swore that it was reindeer he had seen when we got up on to the first height we saw several reindeer on flat ground to the south of us but the wind being from the north we had to go back and make our way south along the shore till we got to leeward of them the only one who did not approve of this plan was the mate who was in a state of feverish eagerness to rush straight at some reindeer he thought he had seen to the east which of course was an absolutely certain way to clear the field of every one of them he asked and received permission to remain behind with hansen who was to take a magnetic observation but had to promise not to move till he got the order on the way along the shore we passed one great flock of geese after another they stretched their necks and waddled aside a little until we were quite near and only then took flight but we had no time to waste on such small game a little further on we caught sight of one or two reindeer we had not noticed before we could easily have stopped them but were afraid of getting to windward of the others which were farther south at last we got to leeward of these latter also but they were grazing on flat ground and it was anything but easy to stalk them not a hillock not a stone to hide behind the only thing was to form a long line advance as best we could and if possible outflank them in the meantime we had caught sight of another herd of reindeer farther to the north but suddenly to our astonishment saw them tear off across the plain eastward in all probability startled by the mate who had not been able to keep quiet any longer a little to the north of the reindeer nearest us there was a hollow opening from the shore from which it seemed that it might be possible to get a shot at them i went back to try this whilst the others kept their places in the line as i went down again towards the shore i had the sea before me quiet and beautiful the sun had gone down behind it not long before and the sky was glowing in the clear light night i had to stand still for a minute in the midst of all this beauty man was doing the work of a beast of prey at this moment i saw to the north a dark speck move down the height where the mate and hansen ought to be it divided into two and the one moved east just to the windward of the animals i was to stalk they would get the scent immediately and be off there was nothing for it but to hurry on while i rained anything but good wishes on these fellows heads the gully was not so deep as i had expected its sides were just high enough to hide me when i crept on all fours in the middle were large stones and clayey gravel with a little runnel soaking through them the reindeer were still grazing quietly only now and then raising their heads to look around my cover got lower and lower 
and to the north I heard the mate. He would presently succeed in setting off my game. It was imperative to get on quickly, but there was no longer cover enough for me to advance on hands and knees. My only chance was to wriggle forward like a snake on my stomach. But in this soft clay, in the bed of the stream, yes, meat is too precious on board, and the beast of prey is too strong in a man. My clothes must be sacrificed. On I crept on my stomach through the mud. But soon there was hardly cover enough even for this. I squeezed myself flat among the stones and ploughed forward like a drain-cutting machine, and I did make way, if not quickly and comfortably, still surely. All this time the sky was turning darker and darker red behind me, and it was getting more and more difficult to use the sights of my gun, not to mention the trouble I had in keeping the clay from them and from the muzzle. The reindeer still grazed quietly on. When they raised their heads to look around, I had to lie as quiet as a mouse, feeling the water trickling gently under my stomach. When they began to nibble the moss again, off I went through the mud. Presently I made the disagreeable discovery that they were moving away from me about as fast as I could move forward, and I had to redouble my exertions. But the darkness was getting worse and worse, and I had the mate to the north of me, and presently he would start them off. The outlook was anything but bright, either morally or physically. The hollow was getting shallower and shallower, so that I was hardly covered at all. I squeezed myself still deeper into the mud. A turn in the ground helped me forward to the next little height, and now they were right in front of me, within what I could have called easy range if it had been daylight. I tried to take aim, but could not see the bead on my gun. Man's fate is sometimes hard to bear. My clothes were dripping with wet clay, and after what seemed to me most meritorious exertions, here I was at the goal, unable to take advantage of my position. But now the reindeer moved down into a small depression. I crept forward a little way further, as quickly as I could. I was in a splendid position, so far as I could tell in the dark, but I could not see the bead any better than before. It was impossible to get nearer, for there was only a smooth slope between us. There was no sense in thinking of waiting for light to shoot by. It was now midnight, and I had that terrible mate to the north of me. Besides, the wind was not to be trusted. I held the rifle up against the sky to see the bead clearly, and then lowered it on the reindeer. I did this once, twice, thrice. The bead was still far from clear, but all the same I thought I might hit, and pulled the trigger. The two deer gave a sudden start, looked round in astonishment, and bolted off a little way south. There they stood, still again, and at this moment were joined by a third deer, which had been standing rather farther north. I fired off all the cartridges in the magazine, and all to the same good purpose. The creature started and moved off a little at each shot, and then trotted farther south. Presently they made another halt, to take a long, careful look at me, and I dashed off westward as hard as I could run, to turn them. Now they were off straight in the direction where some of my comrades ought to be. I expected every moment to hear shots, and see one or two of the animals fall, but away they ambled southwards, quite unchecked. At last, far to the south, crack went a rifle. I could see by the smoke that it was at too long a range, so in high dudgeon I shouldered my rifle and lounged in the direction of the shot. It was pleasant to see such a good result for all one's trouble. No one was to be seen anywhere. At length I met Sverdrup. It was he who had fired. Soon Blessing joined us, but all the others had long since left their posts. Whilst Blessing went back to the boat in his botanizing box, Sverdrup and I went on to try our luck once more. A little farther south we came to a valley stretching right across the island. On the further side of it we saw a man standing on a hillock, and not far from him a herd of five or six reindeer. 
as it never occurred to us to doubt that the man was in the act of stalking these, we avoided going in that direction, and soon he and his reindeer disappeared to the west. I heard afterwards that he had never seen the deer. As it was evident that when the reindeer to the south of us were startled, they would have to come back across this valley, and as the island at this part was so narrow that we commanded the whole of it, we determined to take up our posts here and wait. We accordingly got in the lee of some great boulders out of the wind. In front of Sverdrup was a large flock of geese near the mouth of the stream, close down by the shore. They kept up an incessant gabble, and the temptation to have a shot at them was very great. But considering the reindeer, we thought it best to leave them in peace. They gabbled and waddled away down through the mud, and soon took wing. The time seemed long. At first we listened with all our ears. The reindeer must come very soon, and our eyes wandered incessantly back and forwards along the slope on the other side of the valley. But no reindeer came, and soon we were having a struggle to keep our eyes open and our heads up. We had not had much sleep the last few days. They must be coming. We shook ourselves awake and gave another look along the bank, till again the eyes softly closed and the heads began to nod, while the chill wind blew through our wet clothes and I shivered with cold. This sort of thing went on for an hour or two, until the sport began to pall on me, and I scrambled from my shelter along toward Sverdrup, who was enjoying it about as much as I was. We climbed the slope on the other side of the valley, and were hardly at the top before we saw the horns of six splendid reindeer on a height in front of us. They were restless, scenting westward, trotting round in a circle and then sniffing again. They could not have noticed us as yet, as the wind was blowing at right angles to the line between them and us. We stood a long time watching their maneuvers and waiting their choice of a direction, but they had apparently great difficulty in making it. At last off they swung south and east, and off we went southeast as hard as we could go to get across their course before they got scent of us. Sverdrup had got well ahead and I saw him rushing across a flat piece of ground. Presently he would be at the right place to meet them. I stopped to be in readiness to cut them off on the other side if they should face about and make off northward again. There were six splendid animals, a big buck in front. They were heading straight for Sverdrup, who was now crouching down on the slope. I expected every moment to see the foremost fall. A shot rang out. Round wheeled the whole flock like lightning, and back they came at a gallop. It was my turn now to run with all my might, and off I went over the stones, down towards the valley we had come from. I only stopped once or twice to take breath, and to make sure that the animals were coming in the direction I had reckoned on, then off again. We were getting near each other now. They were coming on just where I had calculated. The thing now was to be in time for them. I made my long legs go their fastest over the boulders, and took leaps from stone to stone that would have surprised myself at a more sober moment. More than once my foot slipped, and I went down head first among the boulders, gun and all. But the wild beast in me had the upper hand now. The passion of the chase vibrated through every fibre of my body. We reached the slant of the valley almost at the same time. A leap or two to get up on some big boulders, and the moment had come. I must shoot, though the shot was a long one. When the smoke cleared away, I saw the big buck trailing a broken hind leg. When their leader stopped, the whole flock turned and ran in a ring round the poor animal. They could not understand what was happening, and strayed about wildly with the balls whistling round them. Then off they went down the side of the valley again, leaving another of their number behind with a broken leg. I tore after them across the valley and up the other side, in the hope of getting another shot, but gave that up and turned back to make sure of the two wounded ones. At the bottom of the valley stood one of the victims awaiting its fate. It looked imploringly at me, and then, just as I was going forward to shoot it, made off much quicker than I could have thought possible for an animal on three legs to go. Sure of my shot, of course, I missed, and now began a chase, which ended in the poor beast 
blocked in every other direction, rushing down towards the sea and wading into a small lagoon on the shore, whence I feared it might get right out into the sea. At last it got its quietus there in the water. The other one was not far off, and a ball soon put an end to its sufferings also. As I was proceeding to rip it up, Henriksen and Johansen appeared. They had just shot a bear a little further south. After disemboweling the reindeer we went towards the boat again, meeting Sverdrup on the way. It was now well on in the morning, and I considered that we had already spent too much time here. I was impatient to push northwards. Whilst Sverdrup and some of the others went on board to get ready for the start, the rest of us rode south to fetch our two reindeer and our bear. A strong breeze had begun to blow from the northeast, and as it would be hard work for us to row back against it, I had asked Sverdrup to come and meet us with the Fram, if the soundings permitted of his doing so. We saw quantities of seal and whitefish along the shore, but we had not time to go after them. All we wanted now was to get south, and in the first place to pick up the bear. When we came near the place where we expected to find it, we did see a large white heap resembling a bear lying on the ground, and I was sure it must be the dead one, but Henriksen maintained that it was not. We went to shore and approached it, as it lay motionless on a grassy bank. I still felt a strong suspicion that it had already had all the shot it wanted. We drew nearer and nearer, but it gave no sign of life. I looked into Henriksen's honest face to make sure that they were not playing a trick on me, but he was staring fixedly at the bear. As I looked, two shots went off, and to my astonishment the great creature bounded into the air still dazed with sleep. Poor beast! It was a harsh awakening. Another shot, and it fell lifeless. We first tried to drag the bears down to the boat but they were too heavy for us, and we now had a hard piece of work skinning and cutting them up and carrying down all we wanted. But bad as it was, trudging through the soft clay with heavy quarters of bear on our backs, there was worse awaiting us on the beach. The tide had risen, and at the same time the waves had got larger and swamped the boat and were now breaking over it. Guns and ammunition were soaking in the water, bits of bread, our only provision, floated round, and the butter dish lay at the bottom with no butter in it. It required no small exertion to get the boat drawn up out of this heavy surf and emptied of water. Luckily it had received no injury, as the beach was of soft sand, but the sand had penetrated with the water everywhere, even into the most delicate parts of the locks of our rifles. But worst of all was the loss of our provisions, for now we were ravenously hungry. We had to make the best of a bad business, and eat pieces of bread soaked in sea water and flavored with several varieties of dirt. On this occasion, too, I lost my sketch-book, with some sketches that were of value to me. It was no easy task to get our heavy game into the boat with these big waves breaking on the flat beach. We had to keep the boat outside the surf, and haul both skins and flesh on board with a line. A good deal of water came with them, but there was no help for it, and then we had to row north along the shore against the wind and sea as hard as we could. It was very tough work. The wind had increased, and it was all we could do to make headway against it. Seals were diving round us, white whales coming and going, but we had no eyes for them now. Suddenly Henriksen called out that there was a bear on the point in front. I turned round, and there stood a beautiful white fellow rummaging among the flotsam on the beach. As we had no time to shoot it, we rode on, and it went slowly in front of us northwards along the shore. At last, with great exertions, we reached the bay where we were to put in for the reindeer. The bear was there before us. It had not seen the boat hitherto, but now it got scent of us and came nearer. It was a tempting shot. I had my finger on the trigger several times, but did not draw it. After all, we had no use for the animal. It was quite as much as we could do to stow away what we had already. 
it made a beautiful target of itself by getting up on a stone to have a better scent and looked about and after a careful survey it turned round and set off inland at an easy trot the surf was by this time still heavier it was a flat shallow shore and the waves broke a good way out from land we rowed in till the boat touched ground and the breakers began to wash over us the only way of getting ashore was to jump into the sea and wade but getting the reindeer on board was another matter there was no better landing place farther north and hard as it was to give up the excellent meat after all our trouble it seemed to me there was nothing else for it and we rowed off towards our ship it was the hardest row i ever had a hand in it went pretty well to begin with we had the current with us and got quickly out from land but presently the wind rose the current slackened and wave after wave broke over us after incredible toil we had at last only a short way to go i cheered up the good fellows as best i could reminding them of the smoking hot tea that awaited them after a few more tough pulls and picturing all the good things in store for them we really were all pretty well done up now but we still took a good grip of the oars soaking wet as we were from the sea constantly breaking over us for of course none of us had thought of such things as oilskins in yesterday's beautiful weather but we soon saw that with all our pulling and toiling the boat was making no headway whatever apart from the wind and the sea we had the current dead against us here all our exertions were of no avail we pulled till our fingertips felt as if they were bursting but the most we could manage was to keep the boat where it was if we slackened an instant it drifted back i tried to encourage my comrades now we made a little way it was just strength that was needed but all to no purpose the wind whistled round our ears and the spray dashed over us it was maddening to be so near the ship that it seemed as if we could almost reach out to her and yet feel that it was impossible to get on any farther we had to go in under the land again where we had the current with us and here we did succeed in making a little progress we rowed hard till we were about abreast of the ship then we once more tried to sheer across to her but no sooner did we get into the current again than it mercilessly drove us back beaten again and again we tried the same maneuver with the same result now we saw them lowering a buoy from the ship if we could only reach it we were saved but we did not reach it they were not exactly blessings that we poured on those on board why on earth could they not bear down to us when they saw the straits we were in or why at any rate could they not ease up the anchor and let the ship drift a little in our direction they saw how little was needed to enable us to reach them perhaps they had their reasons we would make one last desperate attempt we went at it with a will every muscle was strained to the utmost it was only the buoy we had to reach this time but to our rage we now saw the buoy being hauled up we rowed a little way on to the windward of the fram and then tried again to sheer over this time we got nearer her than we had ever been before but we were disappointed in still seeing no buoy and none was thrown over there was not even a man to be seen on deck we roared like madmen for a buoy we had no strength left for another attempt it was not a pleasing prospect to have to drift back and go ashore again in our wet clothes we would get on board once more we yelled like wild indians and now they came rushing aft and threw out the boy in our direction one more cry to my mates that we must put our last strength into the work there were only a few boat lengths to cover and we bent to our oars with a will now there were three boat lengths another desperate spurt now there were two and a half boat lengths presently two then only one a few more frantic pulls and there was a little less now boys one or two more hard pulls and it's over hard hard keep to it now another don't give up one more there we have it and one joyful sigh of relief 
passed round the boat. Keep the oars going, or the rope will break. Row, boys! And row we did, and soon they had hauled us alongside of the Fram. Not till we were lying there getting our bearskins and flesh hauled on board did we really know what we had had to fight against. The current was running along the side of the ship like a rapid river. At last we were actually on board. It was evening by this time, and it was splendid to get some good hot food, and then stretch one's limbs in a comfortable dry berth. There is a satisfaction in feeling that one has exerted oneself to some purpose. Here was the net result of four and twenty hours hard toil. We had shot two reindeer, which we did not get got two bears that we had no use for, and had totally ruined one suit of clothes. Two washings had not the smallest effect on them, and they hung on deck to air for the rest of this trip. I slept badly that night, for this is what I find in my diary. Got on board after what I think was the hardest row I ever had. Slept well for little, but am now lying, tossing about in my berth, unable to sleep. Is it the coffee I drank after supper, or the cold tea I drank when I awoke with a burning thirst? I shut my eyes and try again time after time, but to no purpose. And now memory's airy vision steals softly over my soul. Gleam after gleam breaks through the mist. I see before me sunlit landscapes, smiling fields and meadows, green leafy trees and woods, and blue mountain ridges. The singing of the steam in the boiler pipe turns to bell ringing, church bells, ringing in Sabbath peace over Vester Acker on this beautiful summer morning. I am walking with father along the avenue of small birch trees that mother planted, up towards the church which lies on the height before us, pointing up into the blue sky and sending its call far over the countryside. From up there you can see a long way. Nasadon looks quite close in the clear air, especially on an autumn morning, and we give a quiet Sunday greeting to the people that drive past us, all going our way. What a look of Sunday happiness dwells on their faces! I did not think it all so delightful then, and would much rather have run off to the woods with my bow and arrow after squirrels. But now, how fair, how wonderfully beautiful that sunlit picture seems to me! The feeling of peace and happiness that even then no doubt made its impression, though only a passing one, comes back now with redoubled strength, and all nature seems one mighty, thrilling song of praise. Is it because of the contrast with this poor, barren, sunless land of mists, without a tree, without a bush, nothing but stones and clay? No peace in it either, nothing but an endless struggle to get north always north, without a moment's delay. Oh, how one yearns for a little careless happiness! Next day we were ready again to sail, and I tried to force the Fram on under steam against wind and current. But the current ran strong as a river, and we had to be specially careful with the helm. If we gave her the least thing too much, she would take a sheer, and we knew there were shallows and rocks on all sides. We kept the lead going constantly. For a time all went well, and we made way slowly, but suddenly she took a sheer and refused to obey her helm. She went off to starboard. The lead indicated shallow water. The same moment came the order, let go the anchor, and to the bottom it went with a rush and a clank. There we lay with four fathoms of water under the stern, and nine fathoms in front at the anchor. We were not a moment too soon. We got the Fram's head straight to the wind and tried again time after time, but always with the same result. The attempt had to be given up. There was still the possibility of making our way out of the sound to leeward of the land, but the water got quickly shallow there, and we might come on rocks at any moment. We could have gone on in front with the boat and sounded but I had already had more than enough of rowing in that current. For the present we must stay where we were, and anoint ourselves with the ointment called patience, a medicament of which every polar expedition ought to lay in a large supply. 
We hoped on for a change, but the current remained as it was, and the wind certainly did not decrease. I was in despair at having to lie here for nothing but this cursed current, with open sea outside perhaps as far as Cape Chelyuskin, that eternal cape whose name had been sounding in my ears for the last three weeks. When I came on deck next morning, August 23rd, winter had come. There was white snow on the deck, and on every little projection of the rigging where it had found shelter from the wind, white snow on the land, and white snow floating through the air. Oh, how the snow refreshes one's soul, and drives away all the gloom and sadness from this sullen land of fogs! Look at it scattered so delicately, as if by a loving hand, over the stones and the grass flats on shore. But wind and current are much as they were, and during the day the wind blows up to a regular storm, howling and rattling in the Fram's rigging. The following day, August 24th, I had quite made up my mind that we must get out some way or other. When I came on deck in the morning, the wind had gone down considerably, and the current was not so strong. A boat would almost be able to row against it. Anyhow, one could be eased away by a line from the stern, and keep on taking soundings there, while we kedged the Fram with her anchor just clear of the bottom. But before having recourse to this last expedient, I would make another attempt to go against the wind and the current. The engineers were ordered to put on as much pressure of steam as they dared, and the Fram was urged on at her top speed. Our surprise was not small when we saw that we were making way, and even at a tolerable rate. Soon we were out of the sound, or nippa, nipper, as we christened it, and could beat out to sea with steam and sail. Of course we had, as usual, contrary wind and thick weather. There is ample space between every little bit of sunshine in these quarters. Next day we kept on beating northward between the edge of the ice and the land. The open channel was broad to begin with, but farther north it became so narrow that we could often see the coast when we put about at the edge of the ice. At this time we passed many unknown islands and groups of islands. There was evidently plenty of occupation here for anyone who could spare the time in making a chart of the coast. Our voyage had another aim, and all that we could do was to make a few occasional measurements of the same nature as Nordenschuld had made before us. On August 25th I noted in my diary that in the afternoon we had seven islands in sight. They were higher than those we had seen before, and consisted of precipitous hills. There were also small glaciers or snowfields, and the rock formation showed clear traces of erosion by ice or snow, this being especially the case on the largest island, where there were even small valleys partially filled with snow. This is the record of August 26th. Many new islands in various directions. There are here, the diary continues, any number of unknown islands, so many that one's head gets confused in trying to keep account of them all. In the morning we passed a very rocky one, and beyond it I saw two others. After them, land or islands farther to the north and still more to the northeast. We had to go out of our course in the afternoon, because we dared not pass between two large islands on account of possible shoals. The islands were round in form like those we had seen farther back, but were of a good height. Now we held east again, with four biggish islands and two islets in the offing. On our other side we presently had a line of flat islands with steep shores. The channel was far from safe here. In the evening we suddenly noticed large stones standing up above the water among some ice floes close on our port bow, and on our starboard beam was a shoal with stranded ice floes. We sounded, but found over twenty-one fathoms of water. I think this will suffice to give an idea of the nature of this coast. Its belt of skerries, though it certainly cannot be classed with the Norwegian one, is yet of the kind that it would be difficult to find except off glacier-formed coasts. This tends to strengthen the opinion I had formed of there having been a glacial period in the earlier history of this part of the world also. 
of the coast itself we unfortunately saw too little at any distance from which we could get an accurate idea of its formation and nature we could not keep near land partly because of the thick weather and partly because of the number of islands the little i did see was enough to give me the conviction that the actual coastline differs essentially from the one we know from maps it is much more winding and indented than it is shown to be i even several times thought that i saw the openings into deep fjords and more than once the suspicion occurred to me that this was a typical fjord country we were sailing past in spite of the hills being comparatively low and rounded in this supposition i was to be confirmed by our experiences farther north our record of august twenty seventh reads as follows steamed among a variety of small islands and islets thick fog in the morning at twelve noon we saw a small island right ahead and therefore changed our course and went north we were soon close to the ice and after three in the afternoon held northeast along its edge sighted land when the fog cleared a little and were about a mile off it at seven p m it was the same striated rounded land covered with clay and large and small stones strewn over moss and grass flats before us we saw points and headlands with islands outside and sounds and fjords between but it was all locked up in ice and we could not see far for the fog there was that strange arctic hush and misty light over everything that grayish white light caused by the reflection from the ice being cast high into the air against masses of vapor the dark land offering a wonderful contrast we were not sure whether this was the land near timur sound or that by cape hollander but were agreed that in any case it would be best to hold a northerly course so as to keep clear of almquist's islands which nordenschold marks on his map as lying off timur island if we shaped our course for one watch north or north to west we should be safe after that and be able again to hold farther east but we miscalculated after all at midnight we turned northeastward and at four a m august twenty eighth land appeared out of the fog about half a mile off it seemed to sverdrup who was on deck the highest that we had seen since we left norway he consequently took it to be the mainland and wished to keep well outside of it but was obliged to turn from this course because of ice we held to the west southwest and it was not till nine a m that we rounded the western point of a large island and could steer north again east of us were many islands or points with solid ice between them and we followed the edge of the ice all the morning we went north along the land against a strong current there seemed to be no end to this land its discrepancy with every known map grew more and more remarkable and i was in no slight dilemma we had for long been far to the north of the most northern island indicated by nordenschold my diary this day tells of great uncertainty this land or these islands or whatever it is goes confoundedly far north if it is a group of islands they are tolerably large ones it has often the appearance of connected land with fjords and points but the weather is too thick for us to get a proper view can this that we are now coasting along be the timur island of the russian maps or more precisely laptev's map and is it separated from the mainland by the broad strait indicated by him whilst nordenschold's timur island is what laptev has mapped as a projecting tongue of land this supposition would explain everything and our observations would also fit in with it is it possible that nordenschold found this strait and took it for timor strait whilst in reality it was a new one and that he saw almquist's islands but had no suspicion that timor island lay to the outside of them the difficulty about this explanation is that the russian maps mark no islands round timor island it is inconceivable that any one should have travelled all about here in sledges without seeing all these small islands that lie scattered around in the afternoon the water-gauge of the poiler got choked up 
we had to stop to have it repaired and therefore made fast to the edge of the ice we spent the time in taking in drinking water we found a pool on the ice so small that we thought it would only do to begin with but it evidently had a subterranean communication with other fresh-water ponds on the flow to our astonishment it proved inexhaustible however much we scooped in the evening we stood in to the head of an ice bay which opened out opposite the most northern island we then had in sight there was no passage beyond the broken drift ice lay packed so close in on the unbroken land ice that it was impossible to tell where the one ended and the other began we could see islands still farther to the northeast from the atmosphere it seemed as if there might also be open water in that direction to the north it all looked very close but to the west there was an open waterway as far as one could see from the masthead i was in some doubt as to what should be done there was an open channel for a short way up past the north point of the nearest island but farther to the east the ice seemed to be close it might be possible to force our way through there but it was just as likely that we should be frozen in so i thought it more judicious to go back and make another attempt between these islands and that mainland which i had some difficulty in believing that sverdrup had seen in the morning End of file 7